mucho Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. One more day. I would like to thank uh, all of uh, those who are following up from the streaming. I hope we can be punctual and stick to our schedule, especially for those uh, who are following us online. Let me just tell you that this conference is organized by IMBAO with the support of the School of Architecture of the University of Madrid and thanks to the support of Richard Rehaus, who passed away this year. It's the first year he is not with us on this occasion. And it's organized at the same time of the award-giving ceremony that we uh, organize every year on, on November where we present uh, the Richard Rehaus Prize and the Richard Rehaus, Rafael Manzano Prize, sorry, and the Richard Rehaus Medal for the Conservation of Heritage, which seeks to reward the protection and, uh, and defense of the building trades and know-how of uh, some regions and on this occasion, uh, we have with us the laureate of the Rafael Manzano Prize 2021, Sergi Bastidas, who is going to be our first speaker this morning. His work uh, favors the, uh, the landscape, the blending of the architectural project with the landscape. So without any further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Sergi Bastidas, who is going to present his, his work. Esto es la presentación. Nos podemos sacar sin máscara, no podemos quedar. Como queráis. Sí, es que yo prefiero más. Buenos días a todos. Eh, aquí está mi hijo Gerard. Uh, good morning. My name is Sergi Bastidas. I'm going to present uh, some of my projects. The Can Ferrereta project uh, was uh, commissioned by a developer. This was uh, an 18th century uh, country state with. Uh, mm, and there was practically just nothing surrounding it. And uh, we sought to recover the simplicity of the building. And the challenge, since this was, this was a new construction, we just wanted it to blend uh, perfectly with the environment. This is uh, located in an area called Santañi, a very nice uh, 
town in Mallorca and it stood right in the center of town. So this, of course, represented a great, a major challenge for us to integrate this building uh, with the surrounding environment so that it did not uh, stand out. This is a view of the town and this is uh, the view of the town from one of the upper flo floors of the building. This is the site and there was a very nice tree, the Eucaria, a very old uh, tree which was uh, to us a, a symbol, a symbol of, of, of the site itself. Thanks to the uh, good intentions expressed by the owners, we uh, were able to preserve the existing structure and uh, uh, to extend it by an additional 15 meters which of course meant that the tree had to be uh, felled but of course uh, we uh, prefer to, to, to preserve the tree and leave it in place instead of building an additional two uh, bedrooms. Uh, we have the so-called Kalima or the desert wind that uh, uh, for a few days days in the year flies uh, all the way from North Africa and this is a wind which carries a lot of grains, uh, many grains of sand and uh, leaves uh, uh, a red uh, um, uh, deposit on every structure and after a few years many of the buildings take on this red ochre color. Well, this is not a well-preserved town. It just uh, is as uh, it has always been. Uh, this is the typical house of uh, the town, two-story buildings. All of these facades, as you can see, they were white originally, but with uh, with uh, with time, they have uh, acquired this red uh, uh, hue or. or Well, this is the original uh, condition of the estate. This is the original plot of, uh, of land, 5,000 square meters, with a manor house, Can Ferrareta. Which gave name to the street, uh, Ferrareta Street. The building has a surface area of 1,500 square meters and it has uh, two, uh, two stories, the uh, ground floor and the upper floor. This is uh, the condition of the house as, as, we, uh, as we found it. This is uh, a, a very typical of the Mallorca uh, houses. This is a passage that is uh, meant for the animals to go through. And normally, uh, rolling stones were used for the floor to avoid uh, wear of the floors. And we tried to preserve it uh, completely, and I think we uh, succeeded in that. This is the condition of the garage. Uh, normally masonry and limestone like uh, stone uh, is used uh, for construction so-called maresque which are of a very fine grain and uh, a very high strength. 
All of these arches and, and ribs are built with this uh, material, with these masonry materials. These are just a few more views of the in interior of the house. As you can see, it's just like time has stood still for, for many years. And this is the backyard. Uh, these used to be stables to house the, the animals. And this is the tree that uh, Sergi has just mentioned. We could have extended the house an additional five meters towards the back, but we decided to preserve this tree, which is uh, a very typical of this area in Mallorca. And this is uh, known as a multi-story tree because as you can see the branches, they grow at different heights as if they uh, uh, represented different uh, stories, different floors. And many of the manor houses in Mallorca uh, have this uh, type of tree in the uh, back. And this is uh, the entrance uh, door for the animals and this is where the stables were located, all of these uh, buildings. And this, uh, and we wanted to preserve these. It had to be protected during construction in order to preserve it so that we could uh, um, um, keep it as you can see that there are many arches we gathered all of the construction materials the debris including the tiles the sandstone and the but due to fire uh, to to the fire code we had to build a a concrete slab and then we just put back the uh, wooden beams back in place. These are just a few initial drawings of the project. We were very interested in keeping some sort of a flow throughout the space, the whole the whole area, along uh, the uh, the same axis. This plot um, was located between two streets, the Ferrereta Street, and at the back, uh, a street which did not exist. Uh, which had to be built, including the sidewalks and the curbs and everything. So this is the facade that uh, uh, looks at the new, this new street. And one of the most important axes of the pro project is a pedestrian axis that cuts across the whole site, uh, providing uh, some sort of a continuity in the flow of uh, pedestrians. Well, the existing building is what we call building A. Uh, building B is, is the central building and building C is the one that is uh, located at the back of the site. Well, building C uh, was uh, transformed because we just built uh, a few uh, additional rooms and we just had to um, sacrifice one of the existing towers which was not in a very good condition. This is the design of the uh, back of the building including the uh, the Aucaria tree which was uh, preserved as we've just explained and this was what it should have been but was not uh, finally well anyway the typology of the new building the idea behind it 
was to create a typology which is a, a, the same as that existed in Saint-Agny. We could have uh, built an additional uh, floor, a third floor, but we decided not to, and we decided to just uh, um, preserve the original two-story uh, design. Landscaping was an important part of, of the project as well, because of course this really contributes to provide to provide peace of mind and tranquility. We used um, indigenous plants to avoid excessive water consumption, and of course uh, the challenge is that this was meant to. Uh, be uh, to become a hotel and of course we needed uh, vegetation we needed plants because otherwise it would look just like a desert so that's why we we uh, needed to use these uh, local uh, plants and, and, and native species this is the Aucaria tree uh, as you can see, the branches and the leaves are really beautiful. As you can see, it's just like uh, architectural work or uh, the work of a jeweler. Some uh, jewelers have uh, uh, created jewels uh, in inspired by these very peculiar leaf. The main building houses uh, 60 rooms, one restaurant, one private patio to uh, provide the services to the rooms. All of the attached buildings, which used to be the stables, became uh, the suites, each of one equipped with its own private uh, uh, backyard uh, with uh, vaulted uh, spaces. But, of course, uh, uh, this was a process of transformation of the existing building into uh, uh, the suites. Well, this was not a part of the project. This uh, house did not belong to us, so we had to build this lab in a very uh, peculiar manner in order not to interfere with the residents of the neighboring building. This is the main entrance here. This were the carriage houses, the garage that we saw before with the vaults and the, and the ribs. So we decided to connect the main entrance to the patio and then to the swimming pool and then on to building B. And to us, the axes were very important. It was very important for us that uh, there was an axis running from the tree through the uh, entrance to the swimming pool following the flow of this uh, um, cross-sectional axis. This is a building called Sextado, which is a, um, a, a word used to describe a buildings where sheep uh, sleep, uh, take their naps and protect from the heat. They have very small windows, as you can see but uh, this creates some sort of a venturi type of ventilation that uh, runs uh, flows the, the air throughout the whole building uh, so we thought why not uh, use this idea in in our building b in other words build it uh, following the typology of a stable and and that is the result, the central patio. This is a one-story building, four meters in height, 
um, gable roof, tile the roof with these small uh, windows 50 by 50 centimeters this uh, contain, includes a bar, a kitchen, a gym, massage uh, rooms and a spa and the rest uh, are just uh, utilities and service uh, uh, rooms there is a lift here for the transport of uh, materials and this is where the um, equipment room of the hotel is located and this is the axis that I mentioned before the pedestrian axis that runs through the whole building and uh, on both sides we planted bamboo which is not uh, a local uh, plant of course but we needed uh, to use uh, something to create some feeling of of a private intimate space and we chose uh, bamboo for that here on the edge uh, this is uh, uh, the wall that uh, is connected to the uh, neighbors buildings this is another typical structure of the area the rotter this is a stone construction where Uh, the people who provided uh, the cleaners of the of the manor house lived, and they just uh, lived in these very uh, basic structures. So we've replicated this uh, building right here on the by the swimming pool where the restrooms, the bathrooms and the showers are located next to the swimming pool this is the this is a new uh, project, a new construction which uh, of course as mandated by the regulation has to include a uh, uh, parking, car park for vehicles these are the drawings illustrating the landscaping and the pavements where you can see in detail the different uh, materials used for the floors Of course, the whole, uh, fl all of the floors uh, uh, had to be soundproof, so we use uh, local uh, stones uh, for uh, the pavements. Okay, let's talk about the work itself. This uh, was uh, the situation that we found when we uh, tackled uh, the project. This was completely empty. Of course, we. Uh, we had to clean all of the bushes and uh, uh, because it was completely derelict this was the mm, collection of existing materials this slab was used to build the cornice we had to protect the tree of course the swimming pool, of course, was used to, to as a, uh, to to store all of the uh, architectural elements. This is the the animal passage hallway. We use new flooring. This is part of the 
work in progress, how we rearrange all of the ribs to put them back in place. We had to protect the walls because they are uh, made of earth and uh, since it rains, uh, well, this could have, well, by the way, one of the walls will collapse because uh, it was not protected and it rained a lot, they rained heavily and the whole wall just collapsed. So, we've just dismounted all of the existing structures, we put back uh, new braces and uh, we just uh, put up the concrete slab uh, according to code. We kept uh, the beams in place uh, uh, to brace the walls while we were putting the slab in place. And uh, this is uh, just another view. Well, this is the rolling stone that I mentioned before that we used for and which has to be uh, set dry not with the concrete mixer and I insisted it had to be set dry and as you can see the final result is completely different from uh, that, that that would have been achieved using mechanical means this is the work in progress uh, on the patio we, uh, as you can see, build uh, this pavement in uh, large squares and then we uh, installed uh, the uh, rolling stones for the flooring. This is a staircase uh, in the main building, which is quite organic, as you can see, with a skylight that uh, casts the light from natural light, uh, sunlight from above. Yes, we designed this uh, staircase as if it was some sort of... Uh, sculpture. This is the barraca type of uh, structure that I mentioned before. It's not exactly the same but we used a dry stone uh, uh, and we also uh, built a vault on top of the structure. And this is the final result. This is the Santangi factory which sits next to the site, so obviously uh, acoustic insulation was uh, an absolute must in the project. And uh, this is the view of uh, the, of the uh, well, the, the final view of the, of the project. Because we wanted, as I've said before, to blend uh, the, this project with the existing urban landscape is just like uh, building an oasis within the town of Santangi. This is the mm, uh, second facade at the north that I mentioned before. And this is the main facade with a final finishing uh, using lime to just imitate the passing of time. This is the main staircase. This used to be the uh, old uh, carriage house, which has become a cafeteria. This is a graffiti that we wanted to protect because we thought it was quite interesting. These are the different textures and materials and finishings. The axis that I mentioned before, and you can see how it blends in beautifully with the uh, the rest of the town. These are the towers. As you can see, this plant has thrived and has survived despite the uh, construction, which is a, a nice symbol of the uh, resistance of nature. And this is the oasis lighting. Lighting was important as well. And I think uh, during the night it looks especially beautiful and that's all thank you
muchísimas gracias. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you. A eh, ponencia tendremos acompañando pues una sesión de la misma duración aproximadamente de preguntas en la que pues todo preguntas comentarios donde todo el público está. We now have some minutes for the Q&A. You're all invited to ask your questions, including those who are following us on um, the internet. I have a house um, close by. I'll go and visit this building. What about labor? Could you tell us something about labor? Was it local? Labor, workers, bricklayers and artisans. I mean, where did they come from? As everything in life, of course, I mean, money matters. Of course, money is important, especially if you're Catalan, as I am, from Catalonia. And uh, they chose a foreman, a building company that was quite challenging. I mean, he was just after the money. That's all he cared about. So it's been quite hard these two years. It wasn't easy. I mean, we just didn't get on with our builder. And we were always fighting and arguing with him. He just did whatever he wanted to do. Never followed our guidelines. In spite of that, we did manage to finish the building quite successfully, I believe. Congratulations, Sergi, for such a beautiful project, a very interesting project in the center of town. So congratulations for your masses and uh, for the creation of those volumes <coughs> and um, axes you've mentioned. And I love the way you integrated the building in its surroundings. Are they just uh, concrete pillars or um, loading walls? They're loading walls. Yes, 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 because it's with arena. Or load-bearing walls. <coughs> so you use stone for the door jams and other structures, right? Of course, when we opened up uh, big spaces in the walls, of course, we had to use stone. And what about the formwork? Do they work uh, with wooden beams and reeds? I understand you had to use concrete. Yes, because of the fire code. So they didn't accept wooden beams. Uh, apparently they're out of the code. I mean, they don't comply with the code. So the formwork, we were forced to build with concrete. And then the wooden beams are just um, decoration. They don't bear any weight. So, as you well know, there are new systems that we can use to preserve existing structures in the building. So the wooden beams were just, I mean, aesthetically pleasing. I mean, aesthetically they were important, but not structurally speaking. Last night, during the award-giving ceremony, I watched the video by Irene 
and I found it very interesting the way you placed uh, those reeds and how you tied them up. In Andalusia, we have similar problems. I mean, we have old buildings, wood, wooden structures, and then we have the fire code, and uh, we're not supposed to use wood and this and that. I mean, that problem does not exist in uh, private houses. We could have used uh, reeds and wooden beams, but the new European regulation forces us to use metal meshes plus concrete with the reeds. So structurally, we have to use some connectors according to the code. I mean, they're totally superfluous. We don't need them because reed structures are enough, as shown by centuries and centuries of experience. Once you place the reeds, just the reeds, and you tie it up, you can step on it. I mean, it bears your weight, it's quite sturdy. But the code says otherwise. And what about those uh, Mallorcan blinds? They're tied to the wall. Yeah, we use some bolts to anchor them to the walls. In other cases, a wooden framework is used to hold the blind. The blinds open inward. However, in rural areas, of course, they can open outwards because there's lots of, there are lots of space. But now there are new regulations for rural areas. If the street is narrow, if the curb is narrow, if you open up your blinds, uh, and if they open outwards, you can hit someone, a pedestrian. So when you refurbish an existing building, you either have to fix the blinds or to do away with them. I'm, I'm talking about the ground floor, of course. In this case, you know, there are exceptions. Some details are overlooked. We could use them like this. And what about the color, you, the shade, uh, the shade of blue, that kind of grayish blue? It's beautiful. Well, it wasn't easy to use that color because you know that uh, inspectors make our work harder. They're always coming up, coming up with problems and issues and uh, obstacles. They're supposed to interpret the code and they're very strict. So initially, they didn't want us to use that shade of blue. But we did find a loophole. It's a beautiful color. Greenish, uh, grayish, bluish. No, but according to the inspectors, it uh, should be either green or brown or I don't know. They make things difficult. It's a drawback in our profession. You have to create a project. Uh, you have to satisfy the customer and satisfy yourself, and then you're supposed to convince inspectors. And some of those inspectors are very close-minded, let me tell you. And of course, you have to listen to other people's voices, painters, artisans, and uh, other building masters. That's of paramount importance, of course, I agree with you. We do listen to those who work with us. Listening means learning. They know much more uh, than inspectors. They do these things because they like them, not because of the money. Of course, money is important, but of course, you have to listen to those people. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you very much for this presentation. It was a seamless integration. I have a question. What you told us about 
um, the house where the servants lived. You've showed us some pictures of the original building and then uh, the construction of the swimming pool. <coughs> the area I work with does have some of those buildings. I mean, very similar buildings to the ones you showed us, uh, but those buildings housed uh, ovens for ceramics. I mean, the silhouette is very similar to that of a Moorish oven. Of course, as is always the case, we can't always do what or build what we want to build, or almost never, because of the inspectors and because of the insurance companies. I'm sorry, but the are is in the microphone. We can't hear them. In the past, what they did, they just uh, went out to the fields to pick up some stones and build a hut to provide some shelter for the rain and the storm. So we used a forex pan uh, formwork and then put the stones on top. This is actually a formal resource. I mean, it's just a formality. We didn't need it. But once again, the code. I'm mentioning this because are you referring to lime ovens? We have lots of them in Mallorca as well. They're quite similar, you're right. The silhouette is very similar, the profile. But this used to be a house. Yes. But in this case, the dome of the oven is inside. You can't see it from the outside or the kiln. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to look up some um, kilns in my area. Uh, I mean, the buildings that house those kilns are very, very similar to the one uh, you showed us where the servants used to live. Kilns to bake um, vases and containers housed in uh, a very similar structure. I'm sorry, he's not using the microphone. Yes, it's made of uh, lime, it's lime mortar. In the inside, we just uh, whitewashed everything with a natural mortar or rendered everything. Using some kind of sponges. It looks beautiful. It's quite interesting. It's a natural color with very interesting hues. With the light and the shade. They look uh, quite interesting. Those walls. No microphone. I'd love uh, to see it. Thank you. It's a very useful thing. I've shared it with some friends with uh, similar houses in the island. It does work. But of course, we need to sign it. I mean, we need to take responsibility for that. According to the legislation, we are liable. I'll email it to you. Thank you very much. It's about, no, it's, it's 
So we use a mixed mortar with a nylon mesh, not a metal mesh, because those meshes cause lots of problems after a while. So the 90, 80, 90 kilograms of the Pinot Norte structure plus the 150 kilograms with a mixed mortar. But the wood has an evacuation M1 that uh, drains as much as metal. I'm happy to hear that. I attempted uh, something like that with my engineers, and we thought it was mission impossible. But it's compliant with the code. We didn't manage to have it incorporated in the technical code. But it doesn't really matter. If we sign it, it's OK. We assume responsibility with our signature. I have two questions. First, what kind of um, flooring did you choose for the rooms, for the suites? And the second question, did you find it hard to find uh, some specific traits, some of the masters you need or you needed? Was it hard to find some of them, some of those specialists in some specific trade? Or did you find the qualified workers you needed without any issues? Microphone, please. In this case, of course, there are many jobs that the constructor says, I'm going to do them, I'm going to do them. There's no problem. Of course, we were working with a builder, as we said before, and they tend to say, don't worry, I have the people you need. For instance, with the Rolling Stone, we, needed, uh, we had to conduct um, eight tests. I mean, their workers didn't really know how to go about it. They didn't really know how to work with stone. What they know is to just uh, use concrete and just throw in some odd stones here and there. But in this case, it's totally different. An organic drawing, I mean, uh, you need to know how to do that. Once again, it was another struggle. It's just like a doctor, a surgeon. When you operate on a patient, you just go like this with your hand, and then the nurse knows exactly what the surgeon needs. The same applies to us. I mean, if, you, if you've been working with someone for 20, 30 years, you just have to look them in the eye, and they know what you want, or just remind them of a previous project. They know exactly what needs to be done. You don't need to use any words. But of course, you have builders and then the owners that want to work with their, I don't know, their in-laws or their cousins or their friends. And yes, as to your second question, it was wooden flooring. And then we have other professionals, decorators. I mean, we had to fight for what we wanted. Not so much with decorators. Most of them were young, and they were quite respectful. And yes, the floors were made of wood. I mean, we used uh, wooden flooring. Microphone, please. Is the is the rasilla? Yes, yes, yes. Is the obra, yes. No, my question was that yes. Yes, thin hollow brick. And what about that beautiful staircase? We used a flat hollow bricks. And it wasn't easy, actually. We had to rectify or modify uh, the whole thing many times. We wanted it to be organic, right, curved. We wanted it to be perfect, so it took some work. Microphone, please. Well, 
no, no, si no me acuerdo mal, no hay rodapié, porque soy enemigo de los rodapiés. No, no, la, la, no, la, no, la, no sabía. Sí, no, ah. no, me refiero el, en el peldañeado, en el encuentro de la huella y tabica sí. con la pared. Sí. Pues tenéis la tabica también en flanca, sí. también de... Sin, sin, de, sin rodapié. Sin rodapié. No, es que, es que si le haces el rodapié... Ah, no, lo matas. Lo... Y, sin, y sin vuelo también, ¿no? A rostro. Sí, sí, pero, sí. sí, pues, sí. A, rostro, a, mí es, a nivel, a nivel de nuestros, nuestros diseños y interiores, todos son sin, sin rodapié siempre. Sin rodapié. ¿eh? Y, y sin tapajuntas en las casas rurales, ¿eh? sin tapajuntas sí. lo que es la carpintería. ¿eh? Se creó ya hace años y creamos un foseado para, tú sabes, ¿no? para sí. que la unión sea un portazo donde haya una grieta. ¿no? Entonces, la, la sombra evita este, este defecto. ¿eh? Cuidado, sí. Perdona, gracias. perdona. Última, última pregunta ya porque... no, era una... She's not using the microphone, sorry. Sí, sí. Sí. Well, in principle, I did have a problem here with the decorator. We didn't hear the question, sorry. We did have an issue with the decorator about this. We managed to convince her, but this is just one of a long list of problems we had, which is quite common. <coughs> did you need any special, did you work with a, someone special in the building of the staircase? No, we were just there all the time, monitoring everything. It was a trial and error kind of project. Textures were very important for us. And of course, we had to consider how the whole thing would deteriorate with time. So we managed to use a material that looks soft, but it's very hard. So that when people go up the stairs with their suitcases and this and that, they don't destroy it. And at the same time, we wanted it to be repairable because of course it would not do to have that beautiful staircase full of scratches and stains, so this texture is uh, very suitable for that purpose. Uh, you need to repair it from time to time, but it can be repaired. That was one of the goals. So thank you very much to both of you. We've run out of time for the Q&A. So now we are going to hand it over to Santiago Martinez Otero, a master blacksmith who received a Trifau um, Award in Construction Trades in the category Metal Arts. Good morning. I've come here with one of my colleagues, Thomas, who's going to help me out. He's an, also a master blacksmith in Madrid. He's a colleague of mine, a friend of mine. He was also involved uh, with his work in the Santiago Cathedral. And he's going uh, to lend me a hand. I have lots of photographs, so he'll be showing them. Some of them will just be shown for eight to 10 seconds so that we can explain the most important elements of this project. It's quite common in our profession to do things that are not beneficial for the building itself. Artisans in general, when we do something, when we tackle a project, for instance, blacksmiths, To fix an element in wood or in a different structure, we always do it in cooperation with a um, stone carver 
or the wood guy. We explain what we're going to do so that they get everything ready. It's not that you can work on your own. You have to work uh, in cooperation and coordination with other professionals who use stone or wood. However, architects uh, don't have that view. They look at everything uh, independently, separately, uh, but they shouldn't do that because, of course, uh, metal <coughs> is subject to shrinking and dilation due to temperature, and then uh, you have to consider what kind of stone you're using, limestone or granite or brick or concrete. These are some examples of uh, what I'm talking about. For metal elements to last, they need to meet certain characteristics. We know they're subject to shrinking and dilation. This is a typical handrail in Compostela. No paint, no synthetic uh, elements, no epoxy, no lacquer, it's just iron. Fixed to the stone using traditional techniques. The base is a 35 slab. No, we see here the different rods. It's riveted and fixed to the stone slab. There was an accident. A car ran into the handrail and deformed everything. But if you look closely, the handrail remains intact. There is, of course, some oxide, but not on the floor. Maintenance, minimal. Durability, huge. Impacto, gracias a que están tomadas con plomo, no rompen. And they don't break. These rods don't break because we used lead and not cement or resins. Had we used cement or resins, the handrail would have broken. This is another of the evils or pathologies, a common one, due to lack of knowledge or lack of expertise because they didn't work in collaboration or in coordination with the stone cover. This broke. As you can see, this is in the facade in the main door of the cathedral. And uh, we had to do something. Uh, they had to do something. Uh, the structure broke, and they just decided to weld it together. After welding uh, the metal elements, the metal can no longer shift or move. In all joints or unions, in this case, we have some rivets, which are much thinner than uh, the rest of the grid. But in the summer, of course, Temperatures go up, iron dilates, but since the material here is much thinner, the grid deforms. Temperatura se contrae y vuelve. Al soldar. And does not transmit uh, the heat to the masonry. So, what did we do? We removed uh, the welding and we forged everything here. We recovered the elements and we used rivets, as it was done originally in the upper part of the grid. Below that, we have the door through which workers and tourists access the cathedral. Since they welded everything together in the past, and uh, you can see the results total disaster because there's no dilation, shrinkage, ventilation of the metal, the water remains there, stagnant, and everything was a disaster. From a restoration perspective, I mean, there's a slight problem with metals. They just study cleaning and uh, passivation of archaeological metals. That's all they know about. Uh, what we saw the handrail before in uh, Santiago. There's oxide, but the the floor is totally clean. Now they've used waxes and micro waxes. This was in 2019 and 2020. And we see a huge delamination.
all over the place. The whole thing was destroyed. <coughs> and this is another example of what I was mentioning before, dilation, uh, contraction, and how important lead is. This, there is a weld here, and the stone, due to construction and dilation, has cracked. It has been destroyed by the metal contracting and dilating. This is the finished work. This is a 60 by 60 slab. It's been riveted. And we've uh, retained, or we repaired everything with lead. Lead is a natural buffer. It absorbs dilation and con con contraction. There are many cars now, lorries and cars. There are parties, lots of noise and um, music, and metal transmits noise. And lead is so dense that it prevents that wave um, from traveling to the stone. Otherwise, the metal would, use, would act as a hammer against the stone. Another restoration project, a, a past one, they welded and they used resins. Once again, no dilation, construction, and transmission. So the brickwork ended up totally destroyed. We see now the same element that has been forged. forged. The stone has been repaired. We've used lead. There is some space for ventilation between the stone and the metal for ventilation purposes. And this resembles the original element. And yeah, you see how we use lead. So this is the finished element. It no longer has uh, any welding. Everything has been uh, fitted together perfectly. Lead has been used, and movements, and dilation, and construction, and and, and contractions, um, can be perfectly transmitted. Another mistake. Uh, back in the year 2000, someone decided to use resin. There was no lead, even though in the documents they did mention lead. We found cardboard, resin, and paper, even a Coca-Cola cap. Archaeologically speaking, I mean, just imagine how this would look like 10 years down the road. After dilation and construction, because of dilation and construction, resins end up cracking the stone, because resins are very hard. I mean, they're all very well for certain things, but not to fix metals to stone. Metals, after dilation and construction, especially old metals, which are different from modern metals, and Master Thomas knows a lot about this. Old metals are very different from modern ones. They're totally different, mechanically speaking, and but resins are so hard that uh, with dilation and, and, and contraction, let's say that I'm using lead and resin, right? Resins. I mean, if you hit um, glass uh, with resins, it will break, but not with lead, which is much more flexible and softer. So a lot of resin was used. So the original woodwork or stonework had suffered. So the stone carvers carved uh, some squares. We took out the resins. But in only 15 years, uh, the whole structure was destroyed due to lack of knowledge or excessive confidence. I mean, clearly, it doesn't work. Another element. Uh, an iron rod, a stainless steel inside, resin stone. And this is the right hand um, door. There also some, there's also some welding, the stone has cracked. And this is what we did. We forged these new elements. Uh, there is no water retention. There's a groove for water. We are no longer we no longer have any welding. So it's perfect. Well, as you can see, we've used lead in order to fix these 42 centimeters down the stone. It's all riveted, and 
the lead was installed at a, at a certain slope so that it could drain the water because well, uh, this was just like a natural drain of the water coming from one of the main gates. This is the Puerta uh, Santa, and this is just like the door lock. Uh, they used uh, Portland cement. And we can see the cracks in the original uh, masonry of the facade. And, uh, well, we uh, use lead nowadays. This is another example of a renovation back in 1953 made by Paul de Sorolla. It was uh, covered by uh, mortar. There are many structures which are invisible but are well inside the, the masonry as we can see here. Apparently this was the first time that a dome was removed in a European cathedral from the basis. So, as you can see, this rod, uh, this was hit by lightning and it uh, caused uh, major damage. As we can see, back in '53, uh, concrete was, was used, but concrete does not dilate and the sand uh, used back in those days uh, came from the beach uh, therefore it contained salt we can see now uh, how the mesh had uh, shifted and we can see the before and after because the rod itself was uh, encapsulated and that came as a surprise to us. We can see the huge amount of material that has been lost because lime mortar was used instead of lead. So if we combine lime mortar, irrespective of the type of stone, oxygen and water, carbonic acid is formed, which affects all metals all materials except uh, metal. Bueno, por las cruces, bolas y veletas. It uh, affects all metals but lead. Well, the iron had increased its uh, volume by sevenfold as a result and we can see here the uh, cracking of the granite we can see we've used a bronze we can see a bronze staple which is just like stainless steel but more bad than good is is is, is caused as a result normally iron was used but ferrous and non-ferrous uh, metals have different uh, uh, characteristics. But uh, any uh, uh, process of foundry on metals, they can withstand uh, uh, rust, uh, or, but not sudden temperature changes or, or shocks. In order to prevent these, we use tin. 25 by 5 which is not so thick and does not require that much uh, intervention but it is not a, a piece of foundry so it will not break we can see here the crackings of the stone that we found as we dismounted it so in the area where there was no contact with the lime mortar are intact the iron is intact whereas down here you can see the cracks in the masonry once we've cleaned everything we can see that the metal is only damaged when when it had been in contact with the lime mortar and so we use lead instead 
And this was the damage of one of the mm, concrete domes. The southern tower had the dome had to be completely rebuilt. And the Galician company that is uh, 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 supplying uh, the stones for the reconstruction of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona uh, is in charge of that project. As you can see, a uh, blowtorch was used here to to remove uh, the metal and this of course uh, damaged the granite. We can see clearly how where the uh, lime mortar was uh, located. We can see the full rod here, the areas damaged which have delaminated, but in those areas which were protected by lead is uh, completely uh, in perfect condition. The old iron, contrary to the old, uh, uh, to the current iron, is much more porous. Uh, you can see here the section is 50 millimeters. This is one of the um, um, connecting elements with the studs. As you can see here, no contact with lime uh, mortar. This is a bad practice using polymers. These are completely destroyed by ultraviolet lights after five or six years. The uh, flaking of the metal because of the uh, water that had leaked inside. This was one of the encapsulations that Sorolla had performed, which really uh, shifted the the axis of the of the piece. This was not in contact with the uh, lime mosa, and that's why it is preserved in perfect condition, but in those areas which have been in contact with the lime mortar is completely uh, ruined. Uh, this is one of the few uh, marble pieces in the Cathedral of Santiago, probably from Portugal, since it contains mortar and not the original lead. The wind stress has caused this uh, damage. This is one of the rods which is uh, in perfect condition. This uh, came from the North uh, Tower. These are all hand forged uh, pieces, riveted. This is another rod. That's a side view, the front view. As you can see, these are not clamps or anything. And these are, and there are no screws or anything. These are just clamps and uh, uh, a piece of the original wood. These are just a few drawings of the construction of the pieces. This is uh, the, the, the way they, these metal pieces are uh, joined together. One of them uh, was in a bad condition due to the rain. So we just had to rebuild, uh, uh, or rather to build a new piece. This is uh, a bronze insert. And this is a, a perfect example of, of bad practice. Once again, a crack. And this is a clamp of 25 by 5 in teen. This is the brace uh, that was used to install the stone pieces. And this is uh, the uh, process of assembly. What to reinforce the piece with lead to uh, prevent uh, the piece from being uh, moved by the wind. These are the 
uh, clamps uh, that we use and lead is poured to avoid uh, the metal to be in contact with the stone this is a bell and as we can see the insert includes the iron and the lead covering it that's why there are no cracks in the uh, masonry and we can see here the uh, uh, final design of the crossheads and I would like to show you finally uh, a very short uh, 20 second video that uh, illustrates how uh, the uh, lead in the lead is, is poured to prevent uh, uh, the metal from uh, being in contact with the uh, masonry. Si sí, pica ya ver la propia pantalla a ver si lo da. Bueno, a ver si lo conseguimos porque nosotros para lo antiguo bien, pero para la modernidad Estamos un poquito, para eso estáis vosotros, que estudiáis ahora con las nuevas tecnologías. Pero bueno, que lo que sí, siempre deben trabajar los artesanos, aunque sean diferentes oficios. But I think it's important for all the artisans, uh, no matter what their trade is, to uh, collaborate, to work together in this type of, uh, of processes. Well... We cannot see the video, I don't know the reason why, but it's just a, a very short video that shows how we pour the lead. Anyway, take a rain check on that. Okay. I would like to thank Ian Bao and Richard Rehouse and all of those who made this possible. I would like to thank the Cathedral Foundation and the Consortium of Santiago for giving me the uh, rights, the, the authorization to use some of the images from the Santiago Cathedral. Deja, no pasa nada. Bien, pues como antes, pasamos ahora una ronda de preguntas. Ok, we have a few minutes for questions. Well, congratulations for your very fine work. But since you have a little bit more time now, can you explain the technique of coating the metal pieces with uh, soap and uh, how, what is the, the technique that you use? Well, uh, of course we don't measure the granulometry of metals, we just uh, classify them according to the different colors. And these contracts of colors gives us an idea of the strength. We just heat uh, the metal pieces at a certain temperature and then we soak it in oil. Uh, whale oil used to be used in the past. Aceite de motor quemado. But we used, uh, uh, used, uh, we use, used uh, motor oil these days. We keep uh, the oil at a certain temperature so that when the metal piece, which is very porous, goes in, it just uh, absorbs as much uh, oil uh, as possible. And this uh, creates a veneer that uh, coats the metal so that it prevents uh, rust. And uh, as, you, as we have seen in the first uh, photographs, in the first slides of the presentation, it rains a lot in Santiago, but no rust 
is formed because these two this layer of two microns on top of the metal just uh, full uh, uh, the 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 rain and does not allow the water to penetrate and to uh, form rust well there are different techniques uh, to uh, 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 that can be used in coating um, these metal pieces with, with, with oil. We can use a blowtorch at a certain temperature. Well, there are different techniques. Well, I think we all love our trade. And of course, the last thing we want is to damage any other uh, piece from any other uh, building uh, uh, master or uh, or any other trade so we try to be as respectful as, uh, as possible with all of the other materials well we find a lot of wooden hedges especially in all the masonry we normally fix them when it is uh, very damaged and then we start to use lead. Is that uh, advisable to remove the wooden uh, the wooden wedges? Well, I know very little about wood, just like I know very little about stonework, but of course after many years as a professional I can gather some uh, conclusions, so I try to be cautious. But I think using wooden wedges is wrong. My grandfather used to be a cabinet maker, and wood is not what it used to be. If it, uh, oak uh, wood, once it was cut, it uh, was stored for, for five years before being used in construction. Whereas it is not the, the case these days. They, they just cut off, uh, they f uh, fell a tree and they just put it directly into the drying kills and, and it's used immediately. No, what I'm referring to uh, medieval uh, time wood that we uh, come across very often in, in all the uh, cathedrals. And this is a, a traditional technique, an old technique that we have used uh, in uh, some works like uh, the Logroño Cathedral yeah, but, but there are many differences in wood as it is the case with iron old wood is not the same as new wood and the same applies to iron because some, some say well this uh, iron is from the 18th century but you can just uh, conceal the new uh, metals and, and make it look as if it was 200 years old by uh, applying different treatments. The only way we can determine whether this is actually an old piece or not would be a laboratory test. But if I grab an old iron piece in one hand, uh, the temperature will tell me that the, 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 the older the iron is, the warmer it is to the touch. Have you built uh, uh, metal frames? Yes, we do all sorts of projects. And what is the iron that you use for these uh, frames? In uh, uh, glass windows, well, it depends. It depends on the thickness of the glass, whether the, it is uh, interior or exterior. Uh, whether it will require uh, um, a metal 
joint or not or a, a lead joint and, and what is the right thickness of the lead joint depending on the, the angle so generally speaking Uh, if they're exposed to strong winds, normally would require a thickness of 25 millimeters minimum. But it depends, of course, on the on the on the actual size of the glass window and the the lead, the the thickness of the lead used uh, for the frame of the windows. Thank you, Master Santiago, Master Thomas, for this presentation. Should we do this in German and then? And then you would have to translate into Spanish. Um, wir waren sehr beeindruckt, dass Blei noch verwendet werden kann. Ist das eine Sache, die in? Ah, bueno, es que no, besser auf Englisch, damit es auch übersetzt. In English, okay. So we were very impressed that you can still use lead as a material uh, because we had the same issues that it is not um, permitted anymore. So we, we can't use uh, lead for these uh, joints anymore in Germany. Is that something that is only used in preservation or what, or is there, are there alternatives? Are you facing the same problems uh, in Spain as well? Well, we use lead uh, in rehabilitation, restoration, and sometimes even in new construction. Lead was prohibited because it was supposedly carcinogenic, but there is something which is much more carcinogenic than lead. Epoxies, resins, all of them. and. The guy sitting next to me knows a lot about this because he owned a few epoxy resin companies until he fell in love with the um, forge. Well, um, There are some paints which contain lead, as, uh, as you know, and uh, this was prohibited because it contained lead. But lead can be prohibited, but uh, resin, synthetic, uh, acrylic uh, paints can be, can be uh, used. But this is just uh, the market, this is. Uh, business. Lead is toxic indeed when you handle it, but that's why we have goggles, we have uh, protective gloves, and of course we have to work uh, against the wind so that uh, the fumes from lead is blown away by the wind. But lead is toxic indeed, but epoxy is, is, is toxic as well, far more than lead. Alejandro said that uh, uh, some companies uh, think, well, lead is uh, being used uh, very successfully and prevents cracking in the, in the, in the masonry, etc. What's the need for me to sell resins to impregnate uh, stonework if I can use lead? Well, a lot of people, m m many more people died today from cancer than they did in the past. And my father used to drink uh, water uh, that was flown into the house by lead pipes. 
but we provide a guarantee to our work, a guarantee to uh, maintain healthy, health and safe, healthy and safe conditions in our uh, workshops. And of course, we want to preserve our trade because I think knowledge and know-how is, is very important. A great part of the knowledge, of the know-how that we as professionals have cannot even be found in the books. For instance, in the Santiago Cathedral, uh, a, a wood, a technique used in woodwork was used to um, uh, join two different uh, metal structures in the facade. Lead is prohibited indeed, but uh, speeding is also prohibited and people speed all the time. What is the reason for prohibiting lead? Uh, it's toxic. Well, <laughs> yeah. But whenever they tell me about the technical specs of lead, I tell them, well, I buy uh, the oldest lead I can, I can find, I purify it, I remove the tin and whatnot, and then I uh, subject it to a technical process, and then I start working on the lead following uh, a certain sequence that uh, uh, generates a micro welding of a lead. What is the technical specs of this whole process? I mean, there's no such thing. What are, what are the technical specs of, of an old iron piece in Istanbul, in Santa Sofia, in St. Sophia's uh, Cathedral? Uh, well, uh, this is a, a, a the mosque of, of St. Sophia, it's, um, it's, it sits on a very seismic terrain. Why doesn't it fall? Well, because it is built with materials uh, that withstand uh, seismic vibrations, including lead. Of course, a gun is dangerous, but as long as you don't shoot the gun, it's not dangerous for anyone. The problem with lead arises when you handle lead. But, but I mean, if no one handles the lead one, once it's in place, I mean, what's the problem? I think resins, resins are, are much more uh, dangerous and toxic than, than the lead. We don't even know what are the materials that can be found in our own clothing these days. But, you know, these days it's all regulations and regulations. I hope you've uh, you know, I'll have answered your, your question. So we have time for one last question. We've run out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your work with us. And very concisely and very precisely, perhaps a bit fast, but it was very interesting. I didn't, don't know anything about um, blacksmith's work and uh, forged iron, and I found it fascinating. What about the future of your trade, of your profession? How many artisans are there left in Spain, people who know as much as you do? And a second question, do you have any students? Do you have any apprentices? Who, who, with whom you share <coughs> such a valuable knowledge. Thomas, Ocampo, Morthy, Josme in the past country, Iker, and quite a few people. What we do is we organize meetings. Blacksmiths from all over the country attend these meetings out of our own pocket, right? So we get together once in a while in a specific village that provides us with some funds and in exchange we forge uh, a, a sculpture, a metal sculpture. Anything else we pay out of our pockets but it's like 30 people all in all in Spain. 
master blacksmiths. But in these meetings, we have as many as 160 people, there are only 36 or 40 who make our living out of the forge. And we exchange a lot of knowledge because, of course, weather in Galicia has nothing to do with uh, the weather in Andalusia. And uh, rain patterns are very different as well. In Galicia, it penetrates deeper. It washes the stones away, and uh, it's a bit salty because we're very close to the Atlantic Ocean. So in these meetings, we exchange a lot of knowledge and expertise, and we attract interested people. I'll give you an example, Iker Gabilondo. I started working in this cathedral in 2012, and there are lots of blacksmiths in Spain. Well, lots, quite a few. But I worked with Alejandro Cremata from Alicante. I chose him for the repair of the main portico ironwork. And then I worked with Iker Gabilondo from the Basque Country for the facade and other elements, Tomas Iñaki from Burgos, and Miguel Ángel Martínez Luque from Zaragoza. They all came to Santiago and spent a whole year there with me repairing the facade of the cathedral. So it's important for you as architects to work with people who know everything about the forge and who know about restoration work. The ironwork in uh, the main portico has oil and graphite the door of the Third Order of San Francis, San Francis in the cemetery has the same uh, materials, oil and graphite. Oil and graphite. This knowledge has been shared by all of us. We get together, we exchange knowledge and ex expertise, and that's why we learn from others. Believe it or not, sometimes when we encounter an old iron work, we smell it. The smell tells you a lot, whether it, had, it, had, it has oil and graphite. Uh, we clean not with solvents, but with um, wood sa shavings and other elements. Otherwise, we'll be damaging the structure. Now I have um, five students under me. I'm teaching five people, in other words, plus four additional people. All of them are young, and we are learning from each other. So we do try to share our knowledge. But yes, to answer your question, it isn't easy to find these experts. We also offer uh, some uh, grants uh, to train apprentices for one year. I mean, the funds are limited, but it serves as some incentive, inducement. Luis Petro himself uh, trained uh, one person for a whole year thanks to these grants. It's just our small contribution. The problem is that we need lots of small contributions all over the place. Yes, you're right. But architects have a role to play here, let me tell you. We have a problem that we encounter every day. I cannot compete against someone who cuts and wells and does awful things like the ones I've shown you. But some people say, well, this is cheap because it's only 40,000 euros versus the 100,000 euros I've quoted. This is ruinous for us, but at the same time, it's destroying our heritage. And our heritage belongs to each and every one of us, even if it's in private hands. And we need to do something. Let's say that we have a tender and uh, we have uh, some specs. And uh, a bidder quotes this and that, but they don't do that when it comes to start working, and architects just wash their hands of the whole thing. In many tenders, I only get uh, two points. Two points for my experience and expertise. But who gets awarded? I mean, we win, uh, we are awarded the contract, but then they hire other blacksmiths. This would be up to the, work, to, the, to the architect who should say, no, there are some commitment, commitments here that need to be met. That's how trades, building trades, are disappearing. 
We do many different activities. We organize demonstrations in medieval fairs. You can find true artists in those fairs. I mean, some people can only do two things, but in medieval fairs, you can find uh, wonderful um, weavers, blacksmiths, stone carvers, and just a run-of-the-mill medieval fair. And just to preserve and protect the trades, we have um, to hold different jobs, and architects have a very important role to play here if they really want to preserve these techniques and these trades. In the past 30 years, it has been proven all interventions in uh, historical buildings and uh, our cultural heritage were very damaging, as damaging, uh, much more damaging than interventions done 30, 100 years earlier. They destroyed the heritage. I understand that new materials need to be tested, trial and error and this and that, but uh, interventions done in the past 30 years in our cultural heritage has been, have been tremendously damaging for these buildings and left in the hands of bad professionals. I mean, you see so many abominations if you look at old buildings, even if they're in line with the code. So thank you so much. Thanks to you. Okay. Okay. It was a pity that we have to cut the Q&A short, but of course we run out of time. Now we have a presentation by Paolo Vitti, who is a professor at the School of Architecture. As I was saying before, he's a professor at the School of Architecture in Notre Dame. And he's uh, worked all over the Mediterranean uh, shoreline uh, in very interesting projects. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak English. Uh, 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 this, there is such wisdom and knowledge, what we heard from the craftsmen, where uh, I hardly can say more than what we heard. It's, I could, we could stand and continue uh, discussing about how much we have lost and how we can try to, to gain back what is lost. Uh, one, one topic that has come out in, uh, in this day, between yesterday and today, is the fact that we have codes that we have to follow, and these codes uh, contribute in a, in a fundamental way to this loss. At the same time, we have a building industry which, uh, in all the ways, makes that is impossible to continue to use the same materials and technologies of the past. So the, the building industry wants new products, wants to have uh, continuously something that is new, is innovation, is technological, is uh, extraordinarily positive for the building sector, and at the end, we lose. So there is something we have to do. I mean, this is so clear that we are losing more and more. What we can do? Of course, the, the wisdom and the knowledge of the craftsmen is fundamental. What can do the architects? First of all, learn. There is a lot of learn. And all the, uh, the work I have been doing in my life was extraordinary because I have been working with heritage and conservation is a huge opportunity to look in detail because when we do restore a building, we go into the fabric, we demolish, we change, but what we understood 
after the 1980s is that a good restoration is the one which is similar to the original. And so the belief that there was that with the modernist and the modern materials that could give a substantial contribution to the preservation of heritage uh, resulted to be false. And so we started to go back and look at the, uh, at the vaults. Uh, Sergi uh, Gerard Bastidas, in their work, they look at the traditional uh, heritage. They try to interpret that. We look at this. We have the tools as architects. We use drawing as architects to interpret. We look because drawing helps in understanding. But at the same time, we need to have uh, of course, the, the knowledge of the craftsmen, which is intangible. What we heard today, you hardly can find it in, uh, in, in a publication for the simple reason that, as we heard, it changes from place to place, from condition to condition. So it's uh, summing up many, many things that we cannot summarize in an encyclopedic work. So human beings are creative. They have been always creative. Culture is a creative process. So we build, we add, through our creativity, new things. But we also destroy. And one thing that we have learned from the Second World War is exactly how much uh, we can destroy is something that we were is anthropogenic, is human beings that created and human beings that destroy. Now, after the Second World War, of course, there was an incredible reaction to this destruction, and we were all uh, the world reacted in a way to make a better world, a peaceful world, and there was this moment that there was this incredible belief in the progress, in the development, is the, when the new technologies came through, and we still are living this extraordinary period. But the way we have approached our relationship with nature has broken a balance that was very clear. So what we are facing today is climate change. Of course, it's a topic everybody talks about that. And it looks like it's the topic of the period because it's, let's say, it's fancy to talk about this. Actually, it's not fancy at all. It's a true problem. It's something that we have to face. And uh, the consequences are very clear. Uh, you sh suppose I, you know what is about this overshoot day is the day when, of course, we, uh, we are using resources, and these resources are from our planet. So in this moment, we are using more than, than what our planet can give us. So uh, we Italy, we Italians, we need two and a half Italys to have uh, a balance between the resources we use and what our country is offering. So from 1970 to today, this is the pandemic year. Of course, there was uh, less use of resources. And here we stand. I mean, this is uh, Spain, Maine 25. You have used all the resources your country can give. So you are exploiting other countries, you are exploiting more than you should do. So there is a need to face this problem. Carlo Elefante made a very good statement. The greenest building is one that is already built. So we are now investing to find uh, green buildings, and we build buildings which are using materials that have a very high carbon footprint, concrete, steel, glass. Traditional architecture was using local materials, had a, an identity because it was local, and particularly there was a concept, as we will see, of life cycle. It was also a matter of using materials that were sourced locally, and you didn't have transportation. I mean. It's amazing to see how you build a, a museum in LA and you put travertine that is taken from Rome. Uh, is, uh, it, well, of course, I, I cannot say I'm uh, a specialist in Roman architecture. I know very well 
how Romans express their power through uh, exploiting quarries throughout the, their countries in their dominion. But okay, uh, but this was when, when you look in detail and you look at a building like the Baths of Caracalla, the Baths of Caracalla are made with materials that are sourced within a uh, uh, distance of maximum half a kilometer. Then, of course, you have the marbles, but the marbles as the part that shows power. Okay. Uh, I have been working 10 years in, in Cyprus for, for UNDP, conservation projects. And uh, of course, uh, and my, my first time in Cyprus was in 1990. Uh, I went there, and at that time, you, know, you, you they, they were in a period uh, where they were expanding and there were new architecture. I arrived there and said, well, you have this incredibly hot weather and you, you build these houses which are made with glass, concrete, and uh, uh, very big ones. And you have this tradition of mud brick construction. Why don't you use that? Of course, because uh, there is this belief that to, you live better if you do something modern, not these old-fashioned things. And so they, they, uh, they, they, I have been working. This, the city of uh, Nicosia, the center, is extraordinary with this construction. And all around is a mess of concrete. And now with the crisis they had in 20, is, uh, 2012, 2011, it was a disaster because, of course, suddenly they realized that their houses were not sustainable. And, uh, well, traditional uh, construction has, as we said, local materials. So everything is sourced locally. Uh, the knowledge is gained through experience. So what happens with our architects, young generations, is that, of course, they, they study something, and then when they start to, to work, this something, this technology, these materials have already changed. Where is the experience that you can give? What, how we are using the experience that was gained? There is nearly impossible. And today, we, you have the Masons, as Sergi was saying, uh, saying, that are unskilled because they are not using a knowledge that has been gained through years of experience. Uh, and building techniques, traditional building, may make possible reuse. And we will see that. Uh, uh, so, and of course, they are resilient. And, uh, and the typologies are shaped to the local conditions. Uh, and concrete is the most destructive material on Earth. It's the 40% of the carbon footprint uh, nowadays is based on the concrete industry. And on concrete is everything. I mean, people do floors in concrete. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they nearly, they are, uh, they would like to water the plants with concrete. Concrete everywhere. I mean, and of course, the, the, the building industry of concrete is reacting and says, we will become sustainable. <laughs> they say that, and they are trying to do it. This is a way to do sustainable. What they do? They do a mess, and they try to store the, uh, the production of CO2 in underground. Well, to continue to use uh, uh, to concrete. At the same time, they are using nanotechnologies, but they say, well, yes, this is more sustainable, but it's more expensive. So instead of reducing the cost, we, are, we will be increasing the cost. And then the other thing. The other thing, this is a huge problem because we have to, to think about that the problem is not the, the houses that are built by wealthy persons, but uh, the problem is the simple person who cannot afford to change a window when uh, it, uh, it is uh, weathered by time because it's a timber window. And so they go to the market and say, I would like to repair this window. And what they say, come on, why do you want to repair this window? It's much better if you place a PVC window because you have several advantages, energy savings, enhanced appearance, noise reduction, maintenance ease. Well, this window will last 10 years maximum, 15, maybe 20. The other one was from, I have in my house, I live in a, 
in, uh, in Rome, 1930s, are perfect with some maintenance. They are now with, uh, of course, with the recovery plan, they are obliging everyone to succeed to get to the standards of energy saving, to throw away the windows that are beautiful, are incredibly beautiful to have PVC. I mean, there is something wrong here, but the problem, again, is the the people, the humble people who have to do their own houses and they go to the market and they find that the block cement is less expensive for, than any other material. And maybe you can use uh, Adobe construction, but of course, who is doing Adobe nowadays? No one. And this was, uh, uh, Pizet and Adobe was so widespread in Europe and everywhere. We have to think about all these issues is a matter that you are in the Greek islands, they do the beautiful Aegean style houses and they are made with concrete. It's only the shape, the exterior shape. Where is the consistency in architecture, which is not only the exterior uh, shape of a building, the beautiful building which matches with the landscape. This is the landscape. This landscape is made of villages and not of the sprawl of little houses throughout all the islands. And there is another question that, that came out also from the talk uh, of Sergio Gerard Bastidas, is the fact that traditional masonries were using uh, bonding materials which were weak. Today, our understanding is that uh, all technology has to use strong bonds. All is the idea of concrete, is the idea of steel, strong connections to do a frame that resists in a different way from a traditional material. But as in Mallorca, in Greece, in Italy, and everywhere, they were using earthen uh, 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 mortars, that is uh, with very few amount of, uh, uh, of lime mortar, and they were incredibly resilient to time and to earthquakes. And a building like this uh, fails without maintenance, of course, but all the material can be reused in another construction. But in this same place, the close by, they are building a new uh, house for the summer, for the clients, and they import the stone from, uh, we are in the Aegean Islands, they import the stone from Pelion, from mainland Greece, because the market says that you have to do that. And you cannot use this material. So there is, and then there, there is things there. So this is what, a normal person who ha has to do some renovation as to any engineer and what will be the result. This is the commonest part. The coherent and high quality architecture is the exception. This is what you find. And we should show more of this to understand what we have to fight and where we have to go. So for this reason, I, uh, I think that the past has to teach a lot and we have to work to gain back what we have lost. Here is something that a, a, a colleague of mine posted uh, f uh, a few months ago. He was in Turkey and this boy, Kanan, he had a problem. He wanted to use uh, the the old technique in the renovation of this house. And the problem is that Turkey is, has a, um, a building industry which is made out of concrete and they are expanding, expanding. They have lost people who know where to source the clay to do, to do this wall, which is local. And of course, he wants to do that and he doesn't know how to do because there is not anymore this person in the village who knew exactly which was the good soil and which was the bad soil, intangible heritage. 
So uh, when I was, uh, I spent five months uh, on campus in, uh, in South Bend, in Indiana, uh, and uh, was for me the first time st spending such a long period there. And uh, of course, I started immediately to look at heritage because I was there. And of course, this is, there is heritage also in the United States. And this heritage, this is one of the houses in, uh, in uh, uh, late 19th century in South Bend. It's a very interesting house because it's made exactly with the knowledge that uh, people before the, the introduction of the uh, industrial, industrial process in uh, the United States were building their houses, uh, the, the good houses, of course, this is a stone house, so it's, it's an important house. They built in this way. So what we do, how we gain back, what architects can do to gain back this knowledge? Drawing. So uh, this drawing is spending a few hours in front of a wall and drawing the wall and trying to understand things. So drawing, you understand the contact points within the stone. So you, what you are doing actually is that by drawing, you are reproducing the process of the mason who is building the wall. So you understand how he chooses the, the stones, how he prefers to have contact points to transfer the weight. So that the mortar is not so good, so he knows that contact points are fundamental. Okay, and, uh, and so you go through all these details, so I go very, very quick, and then you understand how are made the floors, and then the exterior walls, how they bond with the structure. So exactly through the drawing, you reproduce the building process. And well, this is uh, another example how you choose and select the materials. You understand where there is the brick because it's, of course, uh, in, in the openings to reinforce and the systems for creating uh, the, uh, all the uh, interior. This uh, South Bend is very cold in the winter time, so the lats are important for uh, isolating for the stone because, of course, all the, the cold weather passes through that, and so on and so forth. I don't go too much in detail. This is something uh, I was, uh, I graduated with Paolo Marconi. It was the moment that we, uh, we, we, we started to, to look at this. Uh, everything already existed, but no one was looking at it. And so we suddenly we started to look at this. I have been working mainly in archaeology, but, but at a certain point also with medieval buildings. I have been studying extraordinary buildings like this Almoravid Cuba and understanding the, the use of tile construction. This might be one of the first examples, and you understand how the process go, why the, uh, the Almoravids they decided to use a technology that was coming from the East and not taking advantage of uh, building techniques that were existing in the Andalus at the time. And, and so now we understood at uh, Notre Dame that we needed to do a, a, a master in preservation that was matching the past with the future. That is to say, to take uh, the, the uh, I'm, I'm done, uh, and uh, to take the advantage of the past to know how to build the future is about sustainability and, uh, and, and resilience. So our students, they do drawings on site, they do bricks in Orvieto, and they are excited when they do that. They want that, our students. And then, of course, because conservation is the most wonderful place to learn about. So this is in Cyprus, again, a restoration project wh where we made. It was fantastic to see how they were working that. The Masons know that. And this is with some al uh, Sali who with, uh, uh, th that made this extraordinary experience in Syria that uh, Salva Gomez explained yesterday about the, these bricks made with the debris from the destruction in Syria. And this is how this knowledge can be used through the capacity of Salva Gomez to make something new architecture, using the past for the future. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, hello. Phone work? Good. Thank you very much. Um, one, one or two observations which are, on which I would like your observations. Um, I have argued that old buildings carry a carbon credit. In other words, because um, uh, they've existed for a long time, they haven't been replaced. Therefore, if they had been replaced, um, the, the more, more carbon would have been used. This is not a, a particularly strong argument. But one of the problems that <clears throat> we are going to have is that um, there's going to be pressure to um, provide additional insulation to historic buildings. Um, in fact, if you read what the Venice Charter says, it says under exceptional, you know, particular circumstances. And this is going to, I think this is going to be a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think providing heat, you know, heating is not, a, is not a great problem, but actually insulating is the thing that it tends to have bulk. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to come under this pressure for, for, for the building. And that bulky materials on will change the appearance of buildings either internally or externally. And uh, I think this is a, a problem that is coming up. Um, and um, I don't really know how one's going to deal with it. I think in Britain, uh, the Georgian group is about to run seminars ex exactly on this problem. Uh, uh, just one observation, then I'll let you, <laughs> let you uh, speak, is that um, when we preserve buildings, what we're actually doing is, is arresting a process of change. We're doing it because the way we change things now is very destructive. But in the past, of course, they changed continually and in a sympathetic way. Um, is, that, is that possibly the answer to uh, the problem that is coming up of, of how, we are, how we insulate buildings? I don't necessarily think we need to, but will be political pressure to do this? Um, uh, so m many things. So uh, I will start saying that historical values, uh, architectural values, and this pose a problem, but uh, we are talking about a huge amount of uh, architecture that is existing that can be reused, sometimes is abandoned, and it, instead of building new houses, we can already reuse these houses. And these houses ha are, are not like the Georgian ones, but are very humble houses that can be regenerated and adapted in a very easy manner. It's a matter of studying the life cycle uh, of a house, and I don't think really that uh, reusing has a higher uh, carbon footprint than rebuilding. And under this point of view, Ferdinando Vegas, they just renovated, they are going to publish very soon. They renovated a house and they made exactly the comparison by renovating in the traditional way or rebuilding in a, uh, in a new way, and there is no comparison. Now, the problem is a matter of costs. He, he argues that also the costs are lower. But uh, the cost is that in the building market, uh, a, a PVC window costs less like a timber window. So it's a matter what we would try to do in our preservation program is not only to study uh, existing buildings, but to extract knowledge from there and create new codes locally, I mean in municipalities, where in that municipality, we understand which are the materials that were used locally, and we try to create codes that allow this. And since we have the famous recovery plan, we can use funding from the EU to make such a process, because this process to start and regenerate needs some financial aid. With the present condition, a person, a normal person, who has not much financial power, cannot do that. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, in, in terms of uh, understanding how much and how we will adapt historic buildings is a matter of case by case, capacity of the architects, and after all is also not only uh, energy consumption, uh, because for instance uh, a traditional masonry building uh, to get heated needs a lot more time than a modern one, but then of course, it keeps the heat for a much longer time. So it's, it's a matter of uh, adapting the, uh, the, the way we approach the calculations in, uh, in, uh, in the, in, in the, uh, to make sustainable to our energy standards a building 
taking into consideration all the other parameters, while typically it's only one parameter that is taken into consideration. As our Smith was saying, that the uh, lead is, uh, of course, uh, 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 not healthy and has been abolished, but then there are other parameters that should be considered. But people like, like easy measurement. So, for example, that there is no universally accepted measurement for longevity. And longevity is one of the most important issues in sustainability. But people like simple things they can measure, like heat loss. And I think what you're arguing for is a more sophisticated and more holistic mm -hmm. view of, of um, how we consume energy and, and to put time into it, not just the immediate moment. Yeah, so we have a, a project that we can uh, submit for the EU for funding in order to make this very complicated. Uh, calculations. So this could be a good innovation, I think. Thank you. I'm sorry, but his microphone is off. Thank you, Julian. Uh, well, uh, as I was saying, uh, it's a very interesting aspect of this uh, uh, initiative to measure the performance of a building and thermal losses as an isolated uh, thing, but not taking into account its interaction with the surrounding buildings, with the streets, with the public space. W whereas in historic cities, there is a certain tradition of some streets or areas which have their own subclimate, if you like. And in other areas of the cities, there's just no concern uh, for uh, local climate. So obviously, you have to take that into account because you cannot just take measurements on a building without taking into account the neighboring buildings, which may help make it more sustainable. And this applies to a section of a street, for instance. So that would be a very nice approach to this type of uh, studies, which is uh, uh, neglected in many cases. Uh, as we said that, in the moment you study locally architecture, you, you understand that there are typologies that have developed through local climate conditions and ways also for the, the, the urban layout is, of course, uh, influenced by all to make the better way, because human beings were, were, uh, were used that uh, there is nature and they have to use this nature for adapting to their lives. And this was absolutely a matter of balance. Today we, we can think, OK, I want to go to Madrid. Let's, let, I will take a Ryanair or whatever. In a couple of hours, I will be there. I mean, this is the way we think today. We think that everything is easy and possible while we are using and exploiting nature. Well, I, I think it was a brilliant lecture. Thank you. Uh, I think the, what we have to resist is fashions which are now goes shorter and shorter. Last year it was COVID, and architects studied the post-COVID city. And of course, COVID prepared the climate change, panic, and terror. And I think we should, the most important book I've read this year is The Bright Green Lies by Liere, Keith, and Jenkins, and another name I forget. And they, they really study all the techniques and all the fashions which are now promoted by, by UN and by European Union, and just deconstruct them. Because they are just another way for the industries to take over even larger and destroy even more <laughs> traditional fabric, pretending that they are sustainable. And they have, uh, Keith and, and Jenkins, they have a very radical uh, position which says that all civilizations are destructive of life and of nature, which is true. But traditional civilizations have always been, they are the most sustainable. In balance <laughs> with nature. 
Well, the other most sustainable traditional architecture is more sustainable than industrial architecture. It has lasted five years, five thousand years at least, and industrial industrial uh, agriculture doesn't even last a century. So I think it's to resist this idiotic and criminal, to my mind, criminal fashions. I think that book is formidable documentation, and one has to read it because now most modernists are now ecologists, just overnight. Now, the only good thing in that stupid film of uh, Al Gore was that, you know, having been ignored ecological issues, it's now ridiculous to panic about them. Because we cannot change having seven million of inhabitants, we cannot change overnight. And all the legislations which come out of Brussels or out of the UN, uh, ICC, you know, the International mm -hmm. Climate Conference, it's, an, it's just a mafia. And they have no interest, they are not rational, otherwise they would ask us. They are on a politics which is just to accumulate power and money, and we should not even bother about them, not even talk about this stupid climate change, because that's the next, the next dictatorship will be a climate dictatorship. And it's all fake. It has nothing to do with ecology. So the only thing we can do is to do our, our métier, work like the, the craftsman who, you know, he showed how important this traditional techniques are, and they have been accumulated over a long period of time. Everyone involved in this enjoy it. They have a right and they should wear masks when they use, uh, when they use because they know that this is toxic, but for five minutes they hammer it, you know, 10 minutes. Whereas now we have to wear a mask for nothing, for a virus which is nothing. I mean, nothing compared to what real pandemic mm -hmm. would do. So I should be aware of, of fashions, intellectual fashions. They are much more di dangerous than, you know, dress and so on. Well, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, the, the, the problem is exactly this, that, for instance, the new European Bauhaus is something that is very questionable. Yeah. And, uh, it's, um, and exactly for this reason, I mean, uh, our experience, I, I, I say that the experience we gained uh, in, uh, in Italy, but you see also here, uh, when we were talking about Santiago de Compostela, is a conservation project. Is where you measure yourself with the past knowledge and the past practice. So the idea is uh, to return to use that and to make uh, codes that make possible, because what we are facing is exactly that it's impossible to do nothing because the codes they, they don't allow to have uh, uh, a floor made uh, with, uh, uh, with timber beams. Traditionally, they, they have to use concrete above it and hide the, the whole thing. I mean, this makes no sense. So it's a matter of understanding and showing and demonstrating the feasibility of, because of course, if you are using codes that come, are adapted to a, a larger country or a larger territory, European, for instance, of course, you lose the local uh, capacity of use local materials and all this. I mean, uh, 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 I totally agree with you. And these are responsibility of the schools of architecture to address this with young generations because young generations are the future. We are not. I am not. I'm done. But I can give my experience. Bueno, perdonad que ya tenemos que llegar al final. Muchas gracias. Eh, tenemos... Well, we have to close this session. Tenemos ahora un descanso programado. We have a break now. Until 12 o'clock. Please don't go too far and try to be back on time because we have to be punctual especially for the benefit of all of us all of those who are connected online so uh, please be back uh, here on time 12 o'clock
Tomamos con la siguiente sesión. Okay, we are going to start the next session. Okay, we're going to move on. The next session, the next presentation uh, will be given by Sebastian and Julia Trese, who are doing an exceptional job in uh, urban, in a more urban setting of traditional architecture. And they are these years uh, win laureates of the Driehaus Prize. So, Sebastian, Julia. Is this microphone working? It should be working. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can, yeah, oh, sorry. <coughs> I'll start. Mm -hmm. I'll leave this in pointer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, thank you, Alejandro, for the invitation and this wonderful conference. Uh, we are honored and thrilled, of course, to, to uh, contribute this conference. And, um, yeah, in the relatively short history of our office, we have tried to remain focused on what we do best, building houses. Having won the Driehaus Prize this year, we are excited to now enter a new field of practice that is participating in the critical discourse on architecture. We are relatively new to this field, at least publicly, and would therefore like to take our time today to briefly, and hopefully simply, explain where we come from, what we do, and how we do it, and by presenting four of our projects spanning from our very first to one that is nearly finished. <coughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> After some intense years at Hans Koller's office, I founded my first office in Berlin, Kreuzberg in 2008. My wife, Julia, um, joined the practice in 2012, followed by our second office partner, Jan Burkraft, in 2013. Over the last 10 years, our office has grown to a team of 20 architects with projects throughout Germany and since 2017 also in Mumbai, India. But let's go back to the very beginning. Our first project <coughs> led us out of the city to the countryside. One hour's drive from uh, Berlin city center, the client of this house found a beautiful piece of land right on the shore of a large lake within a nature reserve, and we were asked to design and build an extension of the already existing building. When we toured the area, we were inspired by numerous simple but beautiful wooden barns clad with roughly sawn pine planks with natural edges. It was the aesthetic relation and constructive parallel to the Japanese uh, wood architecture that provided the idea of carefully adapting the principle of framing and filling. We framed the rough cladding, transformed simple pillars uh, into columns you see this guy uh, transforming a usual uh, a pillar into a column, uh, articulated the corners and has carefully assembled joints. Transferring the same principle to the interior by using profiles at every joint, a tent-like surface tension between wall, roof, and the openings was achieved. If this project was small in scale and influenced more than by surrounding vernacular context, it shows the, in a very simple way how we approach architecture. We do not have to invent, but rather tie in with what we can be found by analyzing it and comparing it to pre-existing and established architecture. From this process, we develop our designs in small, simple steps, adding an additional layer with each step, which in the end results in the idea of the complex ordinary. Our buildings seamlessly blend into the environment, yet retain the independence through the transformation of the found in a new whole. Having spent the first years of our architectural 
um, practice on more vernacular architecture in rural and suburban areas. It is thanks to our long-term partner and developer, Ralf Schmitz, that is not working. Is this one working? Yeah. It has to be closer? Okay, like this, okay. So it is thanks to our long-term partner and developer, Ralf Schmitz, that is a family-run firm that has been um, building uh, real estate with high craftsmanship and quality since 1864 that we were able to um, apply our design approach in a more urban situation. So in 2012, the client bought property on Eisenzahnstraße, uh, that is a small side street on Berlin's only and probably the most famous boulevard, um, Kurfürstendamm. Often compared to uh, Hausmann's over, um, it is clear to see that. Oh, sorry. It is clear to see that in Berlin, there's a lack of overriding principles that create these clear urban spaces and the architectural coherency that is so often admired in Paris. In its side streets, however, um, we discovered remarkable buildings um, that all follow the same set of rules, which is a one or two story high embossed space uh, with lavish entrances and front gardens, followed by um, tectonically articulated um, apartment floors with uh, large balconies, loggias, and bay windows that are often crowned by opulent roofscapes. It was this clear continuity that we thought would be necessary to apply on the client's building site. We therefore decided to travel to Paris to study the urban fabric and uh, Hausmann's universal facade grid that was applied indiscriminately to all buildings. Um, as you can see here, a two-story high uh, bay, oh, sorry, <laughs> a two-story high base that is crowned by a uh, rich balustrade or guardrail that introduces um, the Piano Nobile to be the richest of all floors that also introduces the architectural motive for the uh, floors that come above. Um, with subtle projections and, and subtle swings, um, those facades become elegant compositions um, without losing their coherency to the whole um, and to the street, streetscape. Separated by another balustrade, uh, the étage supérieur, which is often set back from the main facade, and in another architectural expression, uh, it marks the transition to the roof. So with this in mind, we started um, to develop our own grid for our facade, um, applying even roof height. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we applied eve and roof height um, to the site, resulting in a six-story building, we were able to convince our client um, to adapt the typical floor height that is almost four meters, instead of squeezing in another floor. We transferred uh, Hausmann's horizontal structuring by um, developing a two-story high base, followed by three uh, apartments floors, um, crowned by a setback étage supérieur. With a plot size of almost 50 meters, that is double the size of a usual plot in Berlin, um, it was clear that we had to ensure um, a vertical rhythm by creating a dominant center and two counterparts on each side. We then articulated the facade by shifting weights and creating um, hierarchies within the volume. Carving out openings, we were able to achieve a well-balanced well -balanced ratio uh, between wall and window opening. We then left the simple 2D drawing um, and started working on a 3D model, uh, similar to the empiric and also intuitive work of a sculptor. We formed a gently curved um, central oven core um, that. Um, is contrasting with two Baroque-like, sharp-edged um, counterparts on either side, as you can see here and here, um, that are all framing the very same French balcony windows throughout. In transition to the étage supérieur, 
Um, these elements were interwoven with a strong cornice um, that references the height of the existing buildings left and right. The étage supérieur was designed in a more reduced manner, having calm rhythm um, on both sides um, to allow the curved central projection to appear as a solemn crown um, resting upon the main facade. So merging Hausmann's rules uh, with Berlin's typical white plastic masonry structures, Eisenstrasse can be conceived as a typical and also contemporary bourgeois building that, despite its peculiarities, seamlessly blends into the existing streetscape. In the tradition of Berlin's Sukkot buildings, we decided to do a double masonry wall that gives a perfect ground for uh, the plaster work that has been um, applied afterwards. The facade mouldings were done the tradi traditional way, uh, with a metal mesh as base construction. Several layers of lime plaster were applied by running a template, refining and sharpening the edges of the cornice until um, it's very smooth and even. For the garden lodger that has a very complex geometry of an in and out swing um, on the exterior and a flat facade on the inside, we're going to see this later, um, we applied a so-called rabbit's construction um, following more or less the same principles. You have a suspended metal um, construction and layers of plaster, uh, of lime plaster were applied, um, uh, resulting in a very elegant and smooth vaulted ceiling afterwards. So as you can see here, this facade is curving in and out. This one is flat, so the complex geometry. Um, we had, yeah, it was a very complex um, geometry that um, was achieved. We also designed highly detailed ironwork for the apartment building, um, but left open the exact shapes and forms for each ornament. Um, that allowed um, the metal workers to incorporate their experience and craftsmanship um, to each element. So, as you can see here, the roof and the suspensions or the, the um, bearing parts for the roof, there was a design intention, but the metal workers um, sort of did the, the refinement at the end. <laughs> The ongoing collaboration with our client, Ralf Schmitz, brought further projects in Berlin, Düsseldorf, and also Hamburg. In Hamburg's district of Nienstetten, it's an urban borough um, on the right bank of um, Elbe River, our client bought property on Charlotte Niesestraße, on this corner plot. It's a um, residential street that is situated in a very calm village-like area. Uh, with charming red brick houses embedded in rich vegetation and old growth trees. With the intention to build several houses full of character, uh, Peter Wilhelm Jensen Klint's buildings uh, with faces provided the impetus for this project. Um, influenced by the British arts and crafts movement, um, Klint's homes house in the suburbs of um, Copenhagen are an example of stripped down simplicity and focus on materiality. Uh, using one hand-molded brick throughout the whole building, it is the composition of architectural elements such as varying roof shapes, window formats, but also projections and um, bay windows that give the ornamentation of the house. As a result of our research, we developed two houses and a freestanding villa that can be considered as variations of the same typology. Using a shimmering brick and a domed mansard roof on all three objects, the ensemble allows the observer to grasp it as a whole. Playful variations of details, window formats, and also brick details break with the strength and allow each house to have uh, its own individual appearance. So not far from Kurfürstendamm, yet in a very different urban setting, our client Ralf Schmitz bought another plot at Emserstraße with the intention of constructing a multifamily apartment building. 
that would be every bit as good as uh, our house at Eisenzahnstraße, yet have a strong and standalone presence uh, on its own. Located in the rather heterogeneous district of Wilmersdorf, with a much more fragmented fabric of individual buildings from all periods, this area is characterized by remarkable expressionist brick ensembles, such as the housing complex on Ludwig Kirchplatz, um, by Paul Hetzer from 1932, or the Voga complex by Erich Mendelssohn on Lenina Platz, both of which are derived from the early 20th century industrial settings found throughout the city. Four years after completing Eisenzahnstraße, the real estate market had changed significantly in Berlin. Omitting one floor to provide floor heights of four meters and above was simply no longer economically viable. Faced with a seven instead of six story building and a facade length of almost 60 meters, we realized that we needed to rethink proportions and structuring. In the search of strong uh, verticality, yet with respect to the classical order, we were eventually led to Burnham and Sullivan's <coughs> high rise brick buildings in Chicago with their contrasting of often rusticated or highly ornamented two story base followed by continuous columns projections and alternations rising to a large cornice with a gentle outward flare at the top. These characteristics were applied in the design of Emsestraße. In order to gain control of the immense volume, we decided to combine two ordering principles with each other. With this alternating height of one or two storage, the plinth accentuates the facade slide projections and recesses, creating a recurring pattern of frontage on the pedestrian scale. Above that, a dark uh, violet brick facade of Wittmunder Torfbrandklinke, so it's the name of the brick from northern Germany, fine traditionally sintered bricks from northern Germany, yeah, rises above the plinth with monumental three to four story arches highlighting the central and lateral protrusions and landing vertical character to the broad facade. The building is topped by a setback penthouse floor whose continuous alternations and large arch windows add vertical character, culminating the building in decorative crowns with the finely rounded cornice. The physical, next. The physical and visual density of the brick contributes to the building's somewhat familiar presence in the urban fabric, yet adds a certain exotism to it, and one that is certainly intentional. The canopies over the entrances underscore the familiarity to streetscapes of Chicago and New York, a connotation also evoked by the interplay between the rustic stone plinth and the brickwork above. The complex part Oh, the complex parts of the Klinkler brick word, the cornices and arches arrived at the building site as prefabricated, reinforced concrete, sorry for that, <laughs> elements, <laughs> and were cram fitted into the hand crafted masonry wall. So, one back. Infusing our project with a kind of exotism. That is, by taking cues from existing places and architectural heritage at large, can be perceived as typical or even elemental for our practice. It is a practice that has not been invented by us, but goes back to Schinke, Stühler, Persius, and many, many others. Our projects are a recognition of what already exists, it is not about reconstruction, but rather reinterpretation of the past. We tie in our architectural heritage as well as the knowledge about construction and craftsmanship to produce a new architecture that is aware of context, culture, and the physical order of existing places. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much.
tenemos una pregunta de uno de los asistentes virtuales, Joana Murao, pregunta lo siguiente. Los edificios que hemos visto en esta presentación, ¿se construyeron en solares vacíos o hubo que demoler antes edificios que había en el solar? El primero, en el primero solo tuvimos que destruir un garaje, era una reconstrucción. El garaje realmente obstruía las vistas. En el otro proyecto empezamos en un solar donde había una residencia de ancianos que estaba en ruinas cuando el cliente compró el solar. Además era un edificio muy tóxico, tenía materiales súper tóxicos. Era un edificio de los 50 o de los 60, creo. En el proyecto de Hamburgo había un chalet en el solar que se demolió. Por lo menos creamos más espacio de vivienda en el solar. Nosotros siempre procuramos mantener toda la vegetación que había en el solar originalmente, cosa que hicimos en Hamburgo. Y luego en el Strache había un edificio de oficinas que no duró demasiado. Creo que se construyó en los 90. A, final, a principios de los 90 era propiedad de la telefónica alemana. Um, to um, tear that down certainly did harm, but, but at least added new apartments to a very residential area, at least. I want only to ask you, um, was it easy to find in Germany the, the artisans or the craft, craftsmanship or the people, the masters? How it works in our case as, as blacksmiths? Uh, it's, it's very difficult because we, we don't have them uh, anymore. <laughs> so um, for the um, iron work, we, we just we use one master who, who did the fences in, 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 the, in the garden and the front door. And then he made one model, you know, this little brazel uh, form. And then we'd ask another company to, to um, reproduce them. So we couldn't hire this company for the whole project. It's not really a handcraft ship. The work. Yeah. Uh, the same with the brick. I, I said we had to use prefab uh, elements. It's because we have no company who is able to 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 get into this project because it's just too too huge. And we also had to use brick from northern Germany. Even we have brick tradition in in, in Berlin, so we could have used real Berlin or Brandenburg uh, brick, but it's just not possible because they are all gone. So our client, he tried to, to buy a factory to produce the stone or the brick by himself, but also this is just too risky and it takes too much time because these projects, um, except the first one, are really uh, time or tight project. There's a market behind, they have to sell the apartments. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's market pressure, but, but we, we fight it a lot to, to, to achieve uh, this, uh, this kind of, of quality, which is not easy in, in, in these days. careers because there's no really, in Germany, there's no tradition for it. And I find very interesting how, how you developed. I mean, just briefly, I think it's fascinating. Because a lot of people could go that way, you know, could help. I mean, of course, as you said, there's no training for traditional architecture. Or we have at our schools, I think it's the same here. There's no professor teaching traditional architecture. So we can't really learn from the past. 
the exception. Yeah. And um, yeah, as I said, I worked for Hans Koloff. You studied at uh, his uh, studio at ETH in, in Zurich. And um, after four years, uh, which felt like 10 years at his office, I said, no, I have to, to, to do my own office. And then he said, it's ridiculous. You will never succeed. You have no, <laughs> no clients. You have no idea. You're too young, whatever. And then I said, OK. Let's see. And then we started. So we bought a desk, a computer, and um, and just started. And um, what I did was um, I did these the renderings uh, or these uh, computer um, uh, animated images, and and that's the way how we we get into this this uh, image based thinking about architecture. And combined with my um, or I did um, set design before at school and a little theater, so I, I was used to create um, scenes for theater. And I thought there's the difference between real life and theater is not so big. So <laughs> uh, if we are talking about public space, it could also be a theater scene and then just make a drawing or, or start uh, making it beautiful and nice and adapting it to, to the text or the context. And that's what we did. And um, um, yeah, obviously uh, successful. So we, we didn't ex uh, expect the prize, so we were really uh, not shocked, but um, it, it was... I, I think it's very interesting how you went... How you went from, you know, you worked initially, your 3D work was rather for banal projects, which yeah. you had no design influence. Exactly. And then I think you told me the client, you told the client, ah, yeah, you know, yeah, this image... Story. Yeah. Yeah, that, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, so then this client, uh, Ralf Schmitz, <coughs> he, he hired me for his renderings, and then I did this for a year, and then we always start speaking about architecture, of course, because it's a pleasure talking about architecture. And then one day I said, look, we are always talking about architects, and you know I'm an architect. Why, <laughs> Why not? Just we could try and build a house together, and then maybe you go right and I'll go left, and, uh, and that's it. But this is... I mean, this is why when this collaboration started, and this, I mean, they, we, we became friends because this discussion about architecture and then building it, it was so so uh, uh, joyful somehow. It, it's it's a pleasure to 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 work as an architect. Yeah. <laughs> Here there are there are two heavy books produced by the developer, and uh, I asked them to. Sent to the Prince of Wales and they immediately answered. He immediately answered, is great work. <laughs> I mean, what is very important is, and this is why we, I mean, we said when we, when we were nominated or when we got the prize, I said it's not only for me, it's, it's, it's the team, it's my wife, it's, it's the partners, but it's also the clients because today you cannot walk around and, and say I'm the great architect and I know how to transform this world in a, in a beautiful planet. You need teams, you need uh, trust and, and uh, good people and then you can succeed and then you can really change the world in some streets and maybe see what, what's coming but um, that's, there, there's a meaning behind. It's also about you know, your ability to produce plans which are 100% uh, yeah, and then of course we, we as we, we okay we were just two in the office and then we got the first project and we had no idea how to <laughs> how to do it of course, and um, and then we we said okay there's there's this incredible software so we should use this software um, completely and and then using the 3D technology we used the technology to produce the plans and to be sure that the floor plan and section and, and elevation are hundred percent. 100% the same because they're coming from a model. It's not uh, making a drawing of a ground floor and then maybe section which doesn't fit. So it's just one model and it's still what we are doing. And then, I mean, it's very close to, to BIM technology today, but we started 10 years ago with our own BIM <laughs> a model. Yeah. I just have a, a, sh a short comment more than a question. But I, I really applaud what, you, what you're doing and uh, very much applaud you're going to other countries and other cities to look at examples and bring from those examples 
a, a, a new, uh, an approach to the location where you're working now that will be contextual. And I appreciate that very much. And I ha have a quick, very uh, unimportant question, but you, you was that the Monadnock building in Chicago that you looked at, the Burnham? Was it Burnham and Root? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, that was the Monadnock building. So uh, I was, it was nice to see that because I'm from Chicago. <laughs> more work, which is so good that Bob Stern asked him to do a building of his in, in which is an extraordinary election, I think, you know, to, and, and the quality approval. I think you should, no, <laughs> show some more. <laughs> yeah, but 20 minutes, and we thought four projects is maybe even too much, but I mean, I said it's our first presentation, so maybe next time we do better and show more in a very... To um, be continued. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have another question from the people who are following us virtually. Uh, Ramon Alemani is asking if it will be possible to adapt, to create your architecture in, for social housing. He says that your astounding work looks also a bit expensive. That's right. Yes, it is. Uh, and because we, we said this during the last days, traditional architecture is expensive. But um, we are working hard to making it less expensive and to, to reintroduce these techniques in the market. So that's the first step that we have these techniques uh, back to life. And now, of course, this uh, question, social housing, uh, lies on our uh, uh, shoulders um, because we, we, we need beautiful cities and social housing is 80% uh, of all housing uh, districts is usually social housing. And, and if we get more and more or if we get back all these companies to the market, then the price will, will um, 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 decrease, I hope. And then, why, why not should social housing be expensive? We should, or the politics should invest much more money into social housing because they, they, these houses, they are, they are used by, by families, by different cultures. So you have to put a lot of money in these houses to, to, to be durable. So uh, the, the idea that social housing should look ugly and cheap is totally ridiculous. Or, or wrong. I think this. Uh, I think this uh, is working. It's working. What What you said is very important because uh, durability is, which is important about the material and techniques, of course. But durability is also how much people love a building. So if the building is is beautiful, it it will last. And and so. Investing money in something that will last forever, that's very clever, while doing something that no one will love and no one will really want to live there, which is what is normally being done. This is awful, really. And we cannot promise a light version of our buildings, but we could say, take this building and make it social housing, but spend the money. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
quien eh, trabaja en esta escuela en el taller de cantería, que es un, eh, un taller que lleva haciendo una labor muy importante durante mucho tiempo de aproximar a quienes estudiamos en esta casa a técnicas que muchas veces no hay otras ocasiones o no hay ocasiones muy frecuentes de ver durante una enseñanza arreglada de la arquitectura, al menos tal y como está concebida actualmente. En, en la mesa le acompañan eh, Antonio Suárez, eh, quien dirige el Centro Albaicín, que es el centro de referencia en artesanía de, en, en, el, en todo el país. Eh, básicamente es un centro que bueno, viene enseñando oficios desde hace tiempo, pero que además ahora adquiere una relevancia fundamental en el sentido de bueno, pues, eh, regular estos oficios, promover estos oficios e investigar sobre ellos. Está también con nosotros Olga Muñoz, que eh, pertenece a la, a la asociación Greta. Greta es un grupo que lleva... Eh, of the Greta Foundation, a group that has been working in the promotion of traditional building, traditional construction, bringing artisans and uh, builders and architects together. And then we also have Fernando Vela, who's a colleague of ours, a master, a teacher, and now he's the vice chancellor of the Polytechnic University. And he heads the research center on traditional architecture in Boceguilla, Segovia. It belongs to this school here. And it has played a very significant role in the school bringing to the students knowledge about traditional building techniques and traditional architecture. It was fascinating, at least in my own particular case, I was fascinating, fascinated by traditional architecture thanks to this center he heads, he leads. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for your kind words of introduction. So, the members of uh, the panel have been int introduced already. I'll keep it short and sweet. And considering that we have a very active audience, I believe it would be advisable to leave some time for questions. We can share our experience and um, convey key messages, but since we are back to face-to-face -face meetings, I suppose we should take advantage of that to ask questions and exchange knowledge. We should, we should stop acting as devil's advocates. I mean, the devil has lots of uh, very good and expensive advocates. We should start working as prosecutors, devil's prosecutors, to make things as clear as possible. Environmental protection is perhaps the most important driving force to protect the heritage because of the links between construction and the visual hygiene of the world uh, surrounding us. Beauty is revolutionary, and beauty should be claimed as a human right, the access to beauty in the objects we use and the buildings we occupy and the cities we live in. You will know this, but if we list from William Morris to Gener de los Rios to his pedagogical or teaching missions, claiming beauty as something that everyone should have access to, not just the privileged, something that should be a universal right in case you want to access and enjoy beauty. This has a lot to do with the activity of most of you, with the work that you do. So I'm going to hand it over now to the speakers. I'd like to focus on education, on teaching, starting with a question that I'd like each of you to answer. What about the transmission of knowledge? the transmission of knowledge having to do with the training required to restore the heritage and to recover building trades, even in new buildings, in new constructions. I mean, Fernando has a lot of experience 
a very long career. I mean, the fact uh, that uh, you have uh, planted your seed in Alejandra's mind is very encouraging. Okay, we have theory in the school and practice. Uh, but could you perhaps tell us about the training of architects, the training that they find in uh, schools such as yours, and then summer courses and master courses? And then Antonio has the experience of the Albaicín Center, which together with the Leon Leon Craftsmanship or Trade Center is the only place in Spain where building trades are taught and knowledge about these techniques is exchanged. So I'd like you to focus on practice. And then Olga, as an architect, open uh, to this approach with a lot of experience in uh, new buildings and uh, the restoration of old buildings. Perhaps you could tell us about the reality today and the possibilities we have to implement these wonderful and promising ideas we are discussing. Fernando. Is this on? He's asking. Yes, it is. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. And thank you very much for your very kind words of introduction. I can feel your love, as it were. And I'd like to thank Alejandro as well, with whom I share a lot of things. I mean, initially he was my student, I was his teacher, more or less a young teacher back then. So now he's a young teacher and I'm an old teacher about to retire. So in, this past, in these past 25 years, uh, the school has evolved and made a lot of progress uh, it, when it comes to approaching the questions that Miguel, the issues that Miguel has mentioned, I'm an archaeologist. I studied geography and uh, history at, the, at, this, at this university, and I came here to teach the history of architecture. As soon as I stepped into the school, I could feel that the school was very focused on uh, professional teaching. They wanted to approach teaching from a very professional viewpoint. However, the situation back then was a situation where theory was much more important than practice, where the existence of a professional community, I don't know, linked to archaeology, was looked down upon. So you went to school, and you were taught that a professional archaeologist who would cover, who would um, charge for his work, who would receive money for his work, was some kind of mercenary. That archaeology could only be practiced from, I don't know, from the heights of scientific purity. So this was my background. This is what I was taught. And suddenly, I came to the school to this school, which was focused on practice, on practicing professionals, architects doing architecture. It was a totally different viewpoint. No teacher here would have the messages, would convey the message, a very typical message I have heard before. If you do well, you'll end up as I did. It's not how he wanted to become Indiana Jones. But if you study architecture, of course, archaeology, you have some curiosity about the past. You want to discover things. So this was 30 years ago when I came into the school. It was very revealing for me. It was life changing. And in the specific area of traditional architecture or the architecture of tradition, the school, however, was a bit, much, a bit more reluctant 30 years in the past, I mean, 30 years ago, tradition was a term 
uh, that was more or less a negative term, a pejorative term, which is not the case today, when tradition is seen in a very positive light, not just in architecture, but also in cooking and many other disciplines, where tradition is considered to be a good thing, which was not the case 30 years ago. It's just passing on what we've inherited to future generations, that's tradition, and I believe that the school has made a lot of headway in this past 30 years. Initially, they were reluctant to embrace tradition. Uh, modern things were the only flagship they had. But the school has been able to gradually incorporate this uh, tradition-based discourse by implementing wonderful initiatives such as the creation of the stone cutting workshop in the school. For the first time ever, we had a professional, a professional sculptor who together with other teachers could show students how stone is used in construction. And then, then this was followed by other initiatives, Gothic building uh, and um, cabinet making. And today, the university, the School of Architecture, is much more open to the transmission of knowledge, which we consider to be of paramount importance knowledge about traditional architecture. So that was my answer. So based on what you've told us, we could perhaps discuss this new image. You've mentioned the term, the word tradition. But what about the reputation, the profile of artisans and uh, professional builders? I mean, perhaps they need um, a new image, a new face. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to join this panel discussion because I'm no architect. But uh, I think it's interesting for the university to welcome people from other uh, fields. It's true that we have been uh, training, uh, providing training of building arts since 2001, but architecture is a complex uh, field because there are many entrepreneurs, but few um, uh, tradesmen. There are 26 different professional uh, families. Number 26 is arts and crafts, and there is no uh, curriculum especially uh, to train uh, these uh, arts and crafts. We are a national reference center for craftsmanship which is a result of a collaboration between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Labor. There are 33 different reference centers, uh, one for jewelry, other for performance arts and the rest falls under our category, but the idea is to see what uh, can we do uh, regarding the training on the sector to try to resolve the problems that they face. For instance, in the area of research, there's hardly ever any research at all in the area of arts and crafts, but that's not all. Uh, there are very few students we do have uh, difficulties in filling up our classrooms with enough students, so we really need to think how can we attract the young people to professional uh, vocational training in, in building trades and arts. And of course, we have another issue, the training of trainers. So how can we attract uh, the professionals who are work, uh, working as professionals uh, so that they uh, receive training about uh, these uh, traditional techniques so that they can 
become uh, trainers themselves. Thank you, Antonio. I do have a few questions, however. Let's give the floor to Olga first, and then we will start the discussion. Well, in Greta, I would like to explain what what is it that we do in Greta, because uh, the reason behind the establishment of uh, Greta was the idea of the so-called anonymous architecture, domestic, a very simple architecture, even though uh, we thought that the situation of the monumental architecture was far from ideal, what we could describe as minor architecture, which is uh, not very relevant uh, uh, as a whole, it was nonetheless completely unprotected. So we uh, concluded that it was very important to train, train uh, professionals and train the trainers. In formal architecture, you can have different, uh, different uh, tradesmen, sculptures, or a stone worker, but this is something you cannot afford in uh, anonymous architecture. But you, uh, it would be possible to afford good mason workers. So we thought it was uh, interesting to provide parallel training to professionals and masons, and uh, we uh, ended up uh, combining them. Uh, uh, combining both uh, groups and uh, uh, professionals provided the trainer, the training, the stucco uh, artists, the stone workers, and so on and so forth, because we seek a diversity in the training we provide. And it is not easy to, to learn a trade, a trade requires a long time. But at least you can make people aware of the existence of the trade so that they are given the respect they desire. Even though you would not be able to afford one of these professionals, at least you have to be aware that it would be very good, very positive if you could afford their services. So we think it would be good to have vocational training for each of these building arts. But this is uh, something that does not exist uh, for the time being. We know that in future rehabilitation projects, well, the curricula continue to focus on new construction, concrete and steel, and they neglect these uh, very relevant aspects of traditional construction. So you organize training courses, Yes, we've been uh, uh, running uh, workshops and training courses for eight years. And we've established a master's course on uh, traditional construction, 40 hours in, every, in each module. So uh, that's hardly enough to, to, to master a trade, but you learn the basics of uh, stone working, lime, uh, and we also have courses on iron work and woodwork, and we also provide basic training on technical uh, adaptation of buildings without uh, uh, damaging uh, the buildings. Is there any sort of form of recognition, a degree or something like that? Well, we do uh, 
uh, you have a degree but it is not officially recognized however uh, our training is increasingly known and valued and recognized and we are also uh, part of a European research project because well we are very much aware that part of that knowledge is just uh, lost this has happened before in Germany for instance many traits have been lost because the knowledge the know-how has just disappeared so if we cannot uh, rely on the original source of knowledge, the professional, uh, we have to focus on the field work because the monumental heritage is, uh, has been studied and analyzed in depth and can be explained and described properly. However, in anonymous vernacular architecture, uh, the whole thing is a mess really it is completely unstructured it's a it's a it's a chaos really but a beautiful chaos if you see what I mean because of its uh, huge diversity well I would like to uh, I would like uh, uh, to have uh, some sort of, a, of uh, an outcome of this discussion in the form of a proposal. I think the three of you have emphasized that the, the importance for uh, to provide training to those who are interested in um, making your ideas a reality and I'm referring to the uh, inbound network a president of the French Republic a few years ago in a, in a discourse to the nation mentioned the artisans which was Absolutely amazing. Can you think of a uh, Spanish president uh, doing the same? Well, that is unthinkable. Well, in France they do have organization, the famous compagnons that you are f probably familiar with, but they shy away from localism because we're talking about local, uh, local vernacular values but people are not vernacular these days people travel in, uh, all over the place and they meet people from uh, all over the world but in France they provide training at these companions and then they send uh, the trainees to all of the uh, uh, schools all over France so that they learn about uh, all of the different traits could something similar be replicated in Spain? I have two young daughters, but nowadays most uh, young girls, they want to be actresses. And there is 95% unemployment in, uh, in the sector. Nonetheless, they are attracted to acting because of the glamour so could we just uh, make artisans uh, you know be part of a network of exchanges uh, which would provide a certain uh, uh, attraction to, uh, to, to this profession so that they, the young people could uh, think of uh, uh, learning a professional trade as an interesting learning experience uh, because hey maybe I'll go on an Erasmus next year to learn about woodworking in, in the UK or in France or elsewhere I think this could really change the mentality of 
many people who would think, wow, that's lucky, this guy is an artisan. Well, in our master's course uh, uh, on restoration, we've had someone from one of these companions and we've uh, opened up a line of collaboration with them. The Casa Velázquez has just partnered up with the uh, House of Hispanists in France. And I think you've really hit the spot. And this it agrees with our experience, by, by the way. Mar uh, marble towers are very dangerous. We must not just uh, be looking at ourselves in the mirror every day. That's dangerous. And I think that Spanish universities and schools of architecture have opened up to this cross-sectional view of, of a trade. Well, this school is my house. My alma mater is the Polytechnic University. But my homeland, my home is this school. I've been working for 30 years for the school. And I think the School of Architecture has made a great effort at uh, bringing in uh, professionals from different uh, uh, backgrounds. Even though the degree is the main um, education we provide, but we have five different uh, uh, master's courses which uh, train engineers, historians, etc. And that has really uh, enriched the, the value of these uh, uh, master's courses because, after all, uh, you learn a lot from the uh, teachers, but you learn more from your colleagues, and this is a fact. In recent years, we've also made a great effort at providing education, both in the graduate and postgraduate degrees, on uh, building arts, because we, we, we have realized that the students must uh, uh, learn from uh, different trades and different professions. In 1984, and that was a long time ago, students and teachers of this school launched a very uh, interesting initiative. The uh, program for the recovery of abandoned uh, towns. The ministry was the owner of a number of villages in Spain which have been abandoned because of the construction of water reservoirs or dams. Granadilla in Cáceres, another one in Guadalajara and another one in, in Huesca. These three towns, well in Granadilla for instance, a pilot experience was launched with the participation of one of the professors of this school, Javier de Cárdenas, and a very young professor Luis Maldonado, who became professor of, uh, of uh, uh, design of the school, and Luis, who passed away uh, tragically when he was uh, 60 years old. I think his involvement in the Granadilla project was, a la was really a landmark in his uh, uh, career, a lot of uh, students were visited Granadilla and uh, to to uh, practice uh, traditional construction techniques, and, and, and many students had a first uh, time uh, contact uh, with this type of uh, uh, experience. Jose Luis Garcia Grinda, for instance, was very interested in popular Spanish archi architecture. Well, the, law, the list is long, but all of these uh, uh, ended up in, uh, crystallizing the conclusion that this had to be a part of the school's uh, curriculum. We created a master's uh, degree on the uh, 
architecture of historic uh, buildings. And there were three editions of that master's, uh, but it was discontinued, unfortunately, not only because of the master's course itself, but rather because of the, of the teachers, a uh, few of which uh, retired, etc. So I think that uh, when you show people a way, well, people are more than willing to, to learn. What my 17-year-old uh, daughter, uh, she lives in a cell phone or a, a smartphone uh, world. So we really have to do whatever we can to, to convey these messages. Maybe use it, these channels so that we can reach out to them. And uh, I think a lot of uh, institutions are working in this direction and I think this is necessary and I think uh, we're on the right track. Well, I want to be optimistic because I think uh, that we are living in a very uh, good moment in time in terms of uh, building art. Well, we have had some recent issues in terms of supply, the shortages in supply and, uh, and uh, craftsmanship is now being considered as an alternative to go back to the uh, uh, kilometer zero type of initiative, in other words, to, uh, to outsource supplies locally. I think Imbao is doing uh, an excellent job in its uh, initiative address to uh, building masters, because the first thing we need to know is who is out there. I mean, who are the professionals, who are the artisans that are actively working. And thanks to this conference we have been able to, to establish contact with the network because many of our trade schools uh, were not aware of the content of the curricula of other similar schools and we can also, sh we should combine efforts to seek uh, professional certification on the different traditional constructive techniques for instance that is necessary that should be recognized officially because first of all this uh, generates an active support by the administration if you have a certification on restoration, well, you would need a specialized labor uh, who is a skilled, who are skilled in in, in these uh, traditional techniques, just to avoid messy, unprofessional jobs in restorations of cathedrals or monuments, for instance. But the expert should tell the administration what should be included in this curricula, what techniques should be part of that uh, training and what are the resources made available to this uh, uh, training. Well, in the case of Spain, Spain is such a diverse country if there is a center in Galicia for construction uh, the, for, uh, well training in uh, traditional construction techniques, well, they do an excellent job, but uh, if, you, if you're a student uh, there and you learn about uh, the techniques used in Galicia, then if you can land a job in Granada, well, that all that uh, knowledge will be uh, completely useless because, because it's not applicable in a different uh, territory of, of the country. So we need to foster the, the exchange of, of this uh, training, just like uh, artisans in the Middle Ages did. They traveled from one place to another, and learned and were able to practice 
the trade in many uh, different uh, uh, locations. So we should do something similar to create a very solid and uh, structure that could, uh, you know, partner up with similar schools in in, in Europe such as the Compagnons in France. Well, we have a European Federation uh, of uh, uh, trade schools, but there is no such thing in Spain. So I think the first thing we need to establish is what is the minimum content of a common curriculum? What are the basic uh, skills and, and, and knowledge that should be acquired by Masons. First of all, we are preparing a list of what are the trades involved in the restoration of heritage, who does what and why. We are in collaboration with the University of Granada on, um, on them. And once we establish the minimum curriculum, we could just set up a specialization courses. For instance, restoration uh, companies travel all over Spain but of course uh, people need to receive a specific uh, training on these techniques before uh, they tackle any uh, restoration project. Uh, someone mentioned yesterday during the ceremony the importance of uh, uh, blending uh, architectural projects with the, with the landscape or vice versa. And then another thing is the certification of the knowledge provided because obviously the training has to be certified for instance 84 percent of the workers in the country they don't have a, a, any degree or official title and I'm referring to waiters electricians, masons, and there will be uh, changes in the making for vocational training, which will determine that. Uh, dual training is mandatory, and that is a, a, an important step forward. Obviously, this will require some time, a long time of adaptation. And then we have the accreditation of professional skills. It can be accredited through professional experience. And that is the big challenge. However, it's only possible to accredit skills at the vocational training centers or the reference centers. All of the vocational training has been adapted to the... Uh, to the official recognition models with the ex exception of artistic uh, uh, training. For instance, in Madrid we have the National Reference Center of uh, Construction, but they do not provide training courses on traditional construction, so we should uh, make that the uh, reality, once it exists, I think all of the public centers would join uh, the, the effort because they would receive an, an, uh, an influx of, of students on their uh, uh, training centers. Well, I think uh, you've really covered all of the relevant topics in this respect, however, I would like to add that in order for a profession to have uh, a certain uh, uh, potential for the future, uh, well, the first thing you need is prestige. It's just like uh, in these times of coronavirus, everybody wants to be a doctor. All the young people want to be doctors in the future. I mean, why? Uh, doctors have been stressed out and they have worked uh, long, long hours, but maybe money is not all that counts. They also need uh, recognition. And in order to get this recognition, 
the education, the training they receive must be of a sufficiently high level of quality. And this is this does not apply to vocational training. There is no recognition, there is no prestige in being a, a professional. It's amazing that in Spain, a country with such a long history of uh, a construction tradition, uh, very uh, little investment has been made in uh, this aspect of uh, quality of uh, uh, the uh, training provided. And I think uh, the new generations, this is good news, are very much uh, sensitive about uh, the sustainability and climate change. And this is something that we have identified in many young architects who are convinced of the need to use traditional, in other words, sustainable techniques. And I think if we can, can increase this prestige, this recognition, uh, the more young people will be interested. Well, I am thinking of the Barcelona Cathedral, an excellent uh, architect, Mercedes ba Badruca, uh, um, had uh, the restoration work, and the first thing she had to do was just to undo what had been done in the 60s, all the cement that was added, all the iron that was used had to be removed. And she uh, returned to traditional mortars, traditional uh, woodwork, or in the in Palacio de Linares in Madrid, uh, it was uh, reconstructed beautifully, but uh, 10 years uh, later it was uh, cracking because uh, resin and polyester was, was used. But the journalists, the paper said, that there were ghosts in the palace and that's what was causing the damages. And that's all from us, thank you very much. If you have any questions... Thank you. Thank you. Um, about changing, uh, having only vocational school or only college. Um, the Moscow. Uh, sorry, they, they are not. You have to put it like perpendicular. Okay, I'll just take my mask off. <laughs> okay. As you were talking about separating college and trade school. Uh, in the U.S., uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, there is the American College of the Building Arts. And the first two years are all the liberal arts, but then beginning in junior year, they each, each student can learn a little bit about woodwork, about stonework, about ironwork, and, uh, and, and, and building finishes. And then in the third year, I mean the fourth year, they, special, they specialize in one of those and have very, very intensive training. And all of the graduates have instant employment. And uh, many young people are really excited about this. Yet also there are also people who have had a, a career in business or something else. And they're so excited to be able to get, do something with their hands, something with their imagination, something they love. So I think that's, it's a small example, it's a small school, and it's a young school, but it is very successful, and you might consider that as an option also. <laughs> the American College of the Building Arts, and Corey Broadwater is the president. Es que estaba poniendo el ejemplo del American College of the Building Arts in Charleston. So that's a wonderful example, the American College of the Building Arts. They have some basic courses in liberal arts, and then each student can choose a trade, uh, and they receive intensive training. And uh, this school uh, has been very successful so far, 
and Carl has mentioned that those who graduate find a job immediately. It's in high demand, I mean, that kind of profile, because there are very few professionals with uh, such a profile. And there are also people who were trained in very different um, areas, such as business administration, and when they go there, they're just enthusiastic about the possibilities of using their hands and imagination, and they just uh, change, change careers. In Spain, we have um, an issue with university training because it is not possible now to incorporate this kind of training, but we do have some master's courses in the restoration of the heritage, including building trades. We have set up what we call an institutional chair with the Granada University to provide training. I mean, it's general um, training on crafts, not just building crafts. We have a project, Make It Art, where we bring together <coughs> designers, artisans, and artists to work together. And they end up working for a number of months uh, developing prototypes of artisanal products, artisanal products. We have two centers, and we have a proposal in the works to build a house with architecture students in Granada, to build a house using contemporary and traditional uh, techniques uh, to see how this works in practice. I happy to hear you have that kind of training. We'd love to have it ourselves. I mean, I believe that sometimes the most difficult step is the first one. Students, for instance, with a technical background, when you give them the opportunity to do things with their hands, I mean, they find it very hard. The first step is very hard for them, but after that, they're so happy. The same for other professionals, I mean, bricklayers who have had some conservation training and suddenly we ask them, we teach them how to build a vault. They're so enthusiastic and they start doing things differently, right? Once they learn how to build vaults. So the most difficult step is the first one. In Spain, we have a deep-rooted tradition, the crafts schools. Craft schools. I mean, we have a long tradition. They don't have a high profile. It has been attempted to bring them up to the level of universities in uh, their diplomas and so on and so forth. Now, entry requirements are much more, are m m much stricter than in the past. And someone mentioned dual training. So part of the training uh, in that case is given by companies. I mean, it's on the job training as reflected on a very recent royal decree, 11 slash 22, where we find a description of the guidelines to implement dual training in universities. So up to 40% of training uh, could end up being practical provided by companies. I mean, it would be much more challenging in architecture, of course, but in other areas, such as uh, telecom engineering, considering the very solid and major telecom companies we have in Spain, that will be a huge opportunity for students and for companies, having students receiving training, receiving training uh, on the job by experts. So. This is a key element for schools such as this one, because what we focus on is uh, applied science and technology, right? So we are in the forefront of the whole thing. So the possibilities afforded by this paradigm shift 
are endless and also permeability amongst different levels. I'll give you an example. We have a degree in this school on interior design. For the past three years, we've been having a wonderful experience with an association, Profe Madera, teachers of vocational training, vocational training teachers. So our students in interior design are taught many things, product uh, design, technology, and they are supposed to design some pieces of furniture and then a group of students build them. I mean, all of them are young people, university students, 20, 21, um, vocational training, 17, 18, 16, and they work in small groups, uh, five-person groups, to design and design a, a piece of furniture. And it's, I mean, so far the experience has been very, very interesting and fascinating. It's been very fruitful. Our students are exposed to vocational training teachers and vice versa. There is a lot of exchange there. Vocational training teachers who participate in a university-based uh, activity, exchange of ideas and uh, learnings and teachings. I mean, combining everything together, hybridization is tremendously important. In my opinion, it's the future, increasingly flexible structures. And you've mentioned uh, the example in South Carolina. And then I went, when I went to the London Institute and I said to myself, What's important about this is what they teach, not the diploma you get eventually, but the Anglo-Saxon world is one step ahead of us in that area, the English-speaking world. Uh, we're still obsessed with university diplomas. You need that badge, right? That's what people like, to have that badge, that diploma. Um, but we have so many diplomas now. There are one or a dozen, but who's going to have knowledge? the knowledge we need. That's the $1 million question. A diploma is nothing without the knowledge. I'd like to add something here, if I may. When we talk about education, of course, we're referring to those who wish to be educated in the discipline. But what about those businessmen who went to the Chicago school and I've had the chance of um, dealing with um, some activities in the tourism area. What people are looking for today are experiences, more than anything, experiencing. And that's an important possibility to boost traditional architecture and to protect uh, the trades. It's not just a question of people who want to learn, of people who want to improve their trades. We can also share this with people who want experiences, who want to feel something different. I live in a very historical place, and we get more and more visitors, an increasing number of visitors, to spend some time there and to enjoy the views and the buildings. Some people want to touch the stone, to touch traditional renderings, to know why we have different finishes, because, of course, the industry <coughs> is interested in selling as much as possible and in showing what they're selling on the internet. But there is no experience in that. And we can take advantage of that, this thirst for experience. And I believe that if we take that approach, we might be successful. It's not just the world of teaching or universities or schools. Because of course, sometimes uh, training centers, universities are out of the loop have nothing to do with the day-to-day -day of the ordinary man who is thirsty for experiences. We have to educate everyone, including the educators. And those who don't wish to become professionals, who just want to have some experience. This has a lot to do with uh, the re-emergence of walking tours. I want a slow trip. I want uh, to see where I'm going. I want to enjoy the trip. I want to be tired, right? Another example, wine, right? Now people want to go um, grape picking. 
not just enjoy wine. And you're willing to pay for that. You pay for the trip. You pick up the grapes. You're helping the grower, right? Or sherries, whatever. This is just an experience, right? Or the Vitoria Cathedral restoration project. It has pros and cons. But they did have a very successful initiative. It's open because we are restoring the cathedral and people could visit the cathedral whilst it was being restored. Everything was visible, everything was open. They lifted the floor slabs and things like that. This is a new approach perhaps and people like to touch and to experience and this is something that we should take on as a society. It's uh, what we need to offset uh, virtuality, the virtual world. What the Facebook guy says that we'll end up playing basketball with someone in Japan. But I want to see my friend face to face as well. We need something that offsets uh, the emergence of the virtual. And it's just a question of implementing in the art sector what other artisans are doing, other craftsmen. I'll give you an example, Murano. You go to Venice and you see how glass is blown and you end up paying three times as much for that piece of glass. And we have an increasing number of workshops that open up their doors for people to touch things and to experience uh, the process. Um, this weekend in Hortaleza Street, we have the Artisan Week in Madrid. And we'll have in Hortaleza Street many artisans showing how they manufacture their wares. And uh, those initiatives are very important, but when people experience that, everything changes in their minds. In Galicia, one week ago, we had a very nice experience. Uh, craftsmanship on a plate. Chefs showing how they prepare their dishes. And uh, using artisanal plates and uh, silverware. So we should perhaps follow those examples from different areas. Once again, I'm in full agreement with you. It is important for all of us to share the same goals, to move along the same, uh, in the same direction. I mean, that's essential for progress. In Girona, where I come from, sometimes it's been customers themselves who requested that experience in inverted comas. So they were the driving force, our customers, demanding those experiences. And yes, you're right, society values experience more and more. Then I was about to say something similar. I teach in Santiago, in Madrid, in special training courses. Of course, people want experiences, right? But I believe everyone needs some training, my customers included. included. I make my living out of them. Let's say that someone comes uh, with a commission. They want uh, work and I say, okay, 400 euros, and they reply, okay, in IKEA it's only 75. And I reply, okay, go to I IKEA. And then they come uh, uh, to the forge and ask uh, very simple questions that know nothing about our trade. And those people are potential customers. We have to make a living. So what I want to underline is the fact that everyone needs some training. Uh, the population at large should be trained as chefs know very well, as restaurants know very well. If you want prime produce, you know you have to pay for it. That argument 
it's very well known in the world of uh, restaurants and, and uh, it would be impossible for someone to say, how come you're charging 50 euros if I buy it frozen? I'll pay one third of that. Yes, but they've been working for 30 years in that area. We've just, we we're just starting out. But we'll get there, we'll get there. In some countries such as Ireland, they do teach craftsmanships in school. And in Ireland, uh, people do appreciate and value crafts. They know that it takes a lot of time and good materials, that the price you paid is fully justified. And this is something, an example we could follow. It's not that we are able to change the education plans, but we can go up, we can reach out to schools. We can contact schools so that children visit our workshops and understand what we do. When people see and touch things, they end up understanding how valuable they are. I was thinking about this as you were talking. This discussion has been going on for at least 100 years. My students in the school, I teach a history of architecture, as I said before, I show them a very nice comic strip of the Vervingen exhibition in 1914. It's four images. There's a Belgium designer, a very important one, Van der Verde, who proposes uh, the model chair. And we see a beautiful chair with very intricate shapes. Second drawing, Hermann Mutesis, who's a German, who was ambassador to the UK, proposes the prototype chair, a chair that could be mass produced and we see him with his plans and drawings and in the third drawing we see uh, an ordinary guy with a moustache with an apron and with a brush and uh, it says the carpenter proposes the seat you can the, the chair you can sit on this is a joke from 1914 that underlines that shows us how this came about you said before, if you go to a nice restaurant, we want high quality products. If you want to enjoy a wine, we want to know more about how it was made and things like that. And everyone accepts that with, without any issue because everyone can appreciate the value it has. Because every day we have to eat in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, and we like to eat well especially in some countries such as this one here, such as Spain. So what we need to do is we need to educate people at large. And this is what I tell my students. I mean, it shouldn't be based our education on low-cost culture. It is unacceptable to buy the cheapest T-shirt. Perhaps it's not made of cotton. It's made with slave labor. We should be buying less and better things, fewer things and better things. I love going to France and visiting the local markets where people buy their cheese and their wine and so on and so forth, where what's vernacular, what's French, what's regional is celebrated. Perhaps we have this with food in Spain, but not with architecture. We start having it, we start seeing it in clothing, leather. Everyone values a good pair of shoes, good leather work. Everyone understands the value of that, but not in architecture. We are lagging behind quite a bit. I mean, I want to be optimistic, but this discussion has been going on for more than 100 years, but what about Santiago de Compostela. I mean, most restoration work has been made with uh, gran granite from Brazil. In Galicia, of all places, can you believe it? And this is to be blamed on politicians and the institutions. Social change can take place almost overnight. Don't think about geological times, because sometimes there's a volcano erupting and change can happen very quickly. When I was a child, it wasn't heard of to see a woman 
in a bar on her own, alone. It was very much looked down upon, but things have changed very quickly. I'm not an old man yet. The other day, my 10-year-old daughter was uh, telling me about a transgender child in her s class. Someone, I mean, and, and, and she told me that he's very much respected by everyone. And then she was telling me about another girl, and I found out some hours later that she was black, this other girl. My daughter didn't even mention it because it was just natural for her. So this kind of change in society can happen almost overnight. Change can be very fast. So it's up to us to promote this paradigm shift, this uh, new viewpoint, this new perspective in society in line with environmental protection, the future of humanity, and all of those concerns. So change can happen very quickly. It's not just geological change that we're talking about here. So it's up to us to accelerate the change and to, or to make it possible. I'm an optimist, an, an optimist myself. Everything we do is a small contribution. Perhaps we need more contributions. Perhaps we should organize a construction master chef or something like that. That could help us a lot. Who knows? So it's very clear. It's clear that uh, things are improving, albeit slowly. So to wrap things up, we've moved from uh, the smallest details to the highest scale, how to build a city that Judas Sebastian uh, described before. We have underlined and mentioned everything traditional architecture and traditional crafts can contribute, contribute to society, which is a lot. So it's up to us to start doing things better, even if we have to pay 300 <coughs> euros instead of 70 euros, because we'll end up buying something that will make us happy, that we'll always enjoy, that will make our lives better, not just a useless object that will pollute the planet and that will end up in the garbage bin in a few months' time. So that was what we wanted to achieve. Thank you very much to each and every one of you for following us. Thank you very much to the speakers, to the members of the panel discussions. Thank you very much to those who ask questions. Thanks, thank you very much to those of you who are following us on, on streaming. I know it isn't easy, but I hope you found it useful and entertaining. And hopefully, we'll be able to meet again in upcoming meetings. And by the way, if you're not part of the InBAO network, once again, I'd like to encourage you to join InBAO because it's a very easy way to keep in contact and to communicate and to be abreast of the latest news and what everyone is doing. So thank you very much. Intervenir también, claro. Ah, perfecto. Bueno, yo. Ok. Alejandro has asked me to say something. Once again, I wanted to welcome you to the school. I know that uh, the director of the school welcomed you yesterday as the vice chancellor of the Polytechnic University. I'd just like to thank you for your participation. I would also like to thank the organizers in BAO, more specifically Alejandro, and all the institutions that have made this possible. The Rafael Manzano Award on all the different initiatives made possible by the Dry House Foundation for the school. This is a wonderful opportunity to act as hosts and to learn a lot from uh, the knowledge and experience of other people, knowledge and experience we would otherwise have no access to. 
The Polytechnic University, to conclude, is now celebrating its 50th, 50th anniversary. We are a young university, only 50 years old, although our buildings are quite old. Most of them were built in the 19th century in line with the teachings of 18th century Spain. The university was set up uh, as a confederation of centers in, in 1971. We're now celebrating our 50th anniversary. And we're very happy to have this activity contributing somehow to these celebrations. And also the Cernat is celebrating its 25th anniversary at the same time. So we're very young. It's a double birthday, a double celebration, 50 years of the university and 25 years of the SIAD. I'd like to invite you to join some of the activities we'll be organizing to celebrate our anniversaries. I've asked Alfredo to provide you with a list of the activities of the Center of Traditional Architecture. You'll find a copy of those activities if you're interested to find out more about the activities we've organized in the past 10 years. So that's all I wanted to say on behalf of the Polytechnic University, on behalf of the School of Architecture. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. Welcome and congratulations for a very fruitful meeting. Sí. Can you hear me? Oh, bueno. Um, I just want to, I will make this short, but I thank you all for being part of such an important thing. Uh, we began first with, with help, help from Notre Dame and, well, from Richard Driehaus, the Fair Charitable Lead Trust, then the Notre Dame University, and then Intbau. And we began in Spain, extended to Portugal, and we have been helping to grow a, a, an amazing community of people like you. Um, and many of you are here who have been here from the beginning. But because of what you know and what you give and what you share with each other, this will keep going. And I want to thank you. Keep it going, please. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, Carlos.